This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after 10 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And we turn our attention, I think inevitably and immediately, to events in Gaza yesterday, where, as you've just heard in the news bulletin, and uh, of which you were almost certainly aware, seven aid workers were killed in, uh, I, I mean, frankly, almost unbelievable fashion. Three, three separate vehicles targeted by the same drone in, in quick succession, despite their itinerary having been cleared with the Israeli Defence Force and indeed with the uh, insignia of the charity clearly visible. In fact, one of the vehicles that was um, blown up, you can see the passage that the missile made directly through the insignia of the charity. I, I, I need these details, aren't they? But my goodness me, they are they are harrowing. Um, and I, I don't know how this plays with people who have a slightly more internationalist or cosmopolitan view of the world. I, I'm not here to defend the fact that we are inevitably more interested in a story the closer to home it is, and uh, and therefore the killing of three. British military veterans who were working as security guards for the charity convoys is bound to attract a lot more attention than any killing of non-British people, even when it reaches into the 20, 30 thousands. That's just the nature of, I don't think it's even the nature of news, is it? Isn't it, isn't it just the, the nature of, um, isn't it just the nature of humanity? I, I don't just bear with me on this, all right? Because we're going to get stuck into some very heavy conversation. So uh, trust me when I tell you that what, 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 I mean, this might sound a bit odd, but your ears prick up, right? When your hometown is in the news, especially if you grew up somewhere that is not in the news very often. If you grew up in London, it, this probably doesn't happen, but your borough of London, if you hear it in a news bulletin, if you hear Bexley or Brentford or Stoke Newington in a news bulletin, then, or, or, or if you're not in life, if you hear Kidderminster or Chalton Cum Hardy or, I don't know, Burnham Market, you you're, you're, you're just, you're just notice it differently. Even though you've never met the person that the story is about, you just notice it differently. So I, I understand some of the unhappiness about the difference in coverage given to the killing of three British people as opposed to 33,000 Palestinian people. But I don't think it speaks to anything other than, than a perfectly natural sense of, of, of sort of geographical and human priority. I said, just get that out of the way early. We won't detain ourselves unduly with that particular issue because what we have now is a British political problem. You, you have two essential problems. The first is that the government remains broadly supportive of the Israeli offensive in Gaza. And, of course, we continue to sell arms, although nothing like the amount um, of arms that America sells. In fact, I don't even know that removing British weapons from the marketplace for the Israeli government would have a measurable effect upon their capacity. I don't, I don't have the knowledge to comment on that. But goodness me, there's a moral principle in play, isn't there? Even if there is not a, um, a logistical one. Uh, the, the British government now has a problem. Uh, this isn't sort of collateral damage or, or friendly fire. This is evidence of how dangerous it is to be in Gaza at the moment. And we're only talking about it because three British citizens, three former British servicemen have been killed. Deliberately. Uh, you see, these, these missiles did not hit these vehicles by accident. It's important that our syntax and our language is correct. The, these missiles were very deliberately targeted, and, and it was a hat trick of attacks upon three separate vehicles, deliberately spaced apart for safety reasons. And if it illustrates anything, it illustrates just how dangerous it is to be in Gaza today, regardless of whether you are a Hamas terrorist or a newborn baby. And it seems to me this morning that the, <sighs> the attempt by Benjamin Netanyahu's government to justify the killing of anybody and everybody 
has reached a critical moment. Now, you are welcome. Remember, this is a phone-in show. You are absolutely welcome to dispute and to challenge anything that I said. Unfortunately, if you're in the mood to do so, you now have some of the more uh, shrill supporters of Benjamin Netanyahu, both in government and in the media uh, uh, here in America and Israel, saying the quiet bit out loud, essentially justifying the killing of everybody in Gaza because of the actions of Hamas. And that was never going to wash, I don't think, with the broader international community. It certainly was left behind by British public opinion some some time ago, a very long time ago, in fact. We, we've concerned ourselves on this program with questions that I think in, in retrospect were, were, were um, quite horribly poignant, questions about when too much will become too much, when uh, uh, too many killings, too many deaths, how much is too much? These crucial but simplistic and largely unanswerable questions. But I think that the subtext has been throughout a slow move towards the place where there is no limit upon death. Remember, 03456060973 is the number you need if, if, if you don't like any of what I'm saying. But you, you remember when the, the conversation was about how they wouldn't ever possibly target a hospital. And now they've targeted countless hospitals. I don't think there are any hospitals left. The idea that it was being a, a, a surgically conducted in order to go after Hamas, that Hamas was somehow destroyable, that the, the prioritization of hostage releases overrode everything else. Uh, I, I mean, it just none of it really stands up to scrutiny anymore. So the, the, the resistance to the idea that Benjamin Netanyahu was embarked upon the destruction of the Palestinian people in Gaza, either through death or, or removal, which is, of course, logistically impossible, largely because of Israel, partly because of Egypt, I don't know that that position is resistible anymore. So I have two questions for you this morning. The first I want you to really think about, and that is, what, 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 do, what does this teach us? Because it seems to me that the refusal of Israel to let foreign correspondence into Gaza becomes deeply sinister on a day like today. We have to rely upon approved sources or, 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 or the IDF or the desperate Palestinian journalist residents still alive, because goodness knows how many have been killed. We have to rely upon that source of information for our facts. Any facts coming from anywhere else are immediately disputed. Uh, Human Rights Watch tells us that the Palestinian Health Authority is uh, well above average when it comes to showing its workings, when it relies upon mortuaries and hospitals, or not, not many hospitals left anymore, as we said, but it, it uh, relies upon mortuaries and hospitals for uh, death notices, and it details, it lists, it publishes as much detail as it possibly can about anybody listed as having been killed. But still, up to and including the BBC, whenever we mention the death toll, we add, according to the Palestinian Health Authority, which is controlled by Hamas. Now, that throws doubt on the figures. So why don't we add that now to Israel? Why, why don't we say, well, these figures, according to Israel, which has been shown to have been economical with the with the truth about everything from from beheaded babies. There's no evidence. Like even Joe Biden talked about babies having been beheaded. There, 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 there is no evidence of that. So why don't we do that with Israel now? After they killed three British military heroes uh, and they're conducting their own inquiry into it while still not letting foreign journalists into the territory. So what did we learn? What do we learn from the killing of these three former British servicemen? I, I think if you haven't learned this lesson already, you can no longer pretend not to believe that everybody in Gaza is a target. 03456060973. And here's a slightly more complicated question. The, the, the front page is are united today in their condemnation. The, the, the cheaper prints lean more towards emotion, of course, with, with talk of heroes and, and, and veterans. The slightly more serious newspapers describe the outcry over 
the aid worker deaths. Um, the Telegraph tells us that Rishi Sunak is demanding answers after Israel airstrike kills Britons. Well, I've got some bad news for Rishi Sunak. Benjamin Netanyahu couldn't give two figs about what you think, mate. He couldn't give two figs because if he did, this wouldn't have happened. If he did, the rhetoric, let alone the military action, would have been very different if he cared a, a, a jot about what Rishi Sunak thinks. It's questionable now whether he cares about what Joe Biden thinks. Joe Biden has released a statement in the last few minutes expressing utter horror at what happened in Gaza to these aid workers. And the question then becomes, what do you want your government to do now? So those are your two questions. What do we learn from this killing? This very deliberate and targeted killing of an aid convoy in three separate vehicles deliberately spaced apart in order to minimise the likelihood of casualty being taken out by the same drone in three separate missile with three separate missiles and leaving three British military veterans dead along with um, four other aid workers. What do we learn from that? And what do you want your government to do? The numbers you need this morning are 0345 973 And I am going to ask you a question that I've already at least partly answered. If you have family in Gaza or the West Bank, do you understand why, finally today, Israel's I'd like to say indiscriminate. It's almost more forgivable if this was accidental. Do you understand today why Israel's very deliberate killing of completely innocent people is finally getting the coverage that you have felt for months that it deserves? Do you understand why? Because if you don't, I don't laugh or, or think that I've lost the plot. If you don't understand why, I think I'd like to help you. Because it must be awful. To, to be sitting there having lost family perhaps already wondering why finally now people in this country people in my profession people around you finally now people seem to be saying enough is enough because the death toll you know I, I think I heard one statistic that it was eight, eight deaths an hour since October the 7th. I may have got that wrong. It may have been eight a day. I forget. But the, but the point is, it's, it's, it's huge now. The numbers almost become too big to compute. And yet it is these seven deaths, and very particularly these three deaths, that seem to have moved the dial. You, you will remember, I think, that when the Israeli ambassador to the UK, Tsipi Hotavelli, in uh, an appearance on, I think, Ian Dale's programme, it almost almost sort of said uh, that there, there, there can be no limit on the killing. There, there is no... I mean, forget the precise words, and one has a great responsibility to be very careful here, but I'll tell you how I'll phrase it. The idea among supporters of the Israeli military and the Israeli government that there are no innocent people in Gaza... I think has just been completely destroyed, hasn't it? And, and I think that they were relying upon that and have relied upon that up until this point. There are no innocent people in Gaza. Well, what about the aid workers and the British military heroes who are there to protect them? I should stop saying heroes. I, I criticise others for being too emotional. So there it is. What, what do we learn from this and what do you want your government to do? Hit the numbers now. You will get through. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Um, 20 minutes after 10 is the time. And one more comment, which I have alluded to and, and nudged you towards a lot since uh, probably the, the middle towards the end of last October. And, and it is this, and I say it with great regret, really, that you need critical friends. You need critical friends in the room. And by shutting critical friends out of the room, by, by calling them anti-Semitic or Hamas supporters, by uh, uh, maligning and insulting them and, and denigrating them, by shutting them or trying and failing to shut them down, you help contribute to the environment in which what is happening and what has happened can happen. You need critical friends in the room. If, if you, as a supporter of and a believer in Israel, and I'm both of those things, if you think that you're 
interests are best served by allying yourself with obvious recorded Islamophobes, with admirers of Donald Trump and Viktor Orban. If, if you think that the people best placed to speak for you in the West are the people who rub their hands with relish at the thought of Muslims being butchered in Gaza, then you really need to give your head a wobble. Nothing more valuable in complicated situations than critical friends. And the attempt to silence them has been horrible to watch. 21 minutes after 10 is the time. And that's why today I, I won't be um, putting any of uh, the tiny number of, of remaining weirdos who would ordinarily be put in idiot's corner with their claims that this is all perfectly normal behavior or Israel has done nothing wrong or anybody criticizing the killers of these soldiers is a supporter of Hamas or that all of the deaths are on the perpetrators of the atrocity of October the 7th. I, 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 today you will be, I'm afraid, shouting into the void because this is a conversation for grown-ups. And we will begin with Holly, who's in Derby. Holly, what would you like to say? Um, hello. hello. I'd like to say that um, well, it's <laughs> you, you, you can't put it into words. No. Like, well, you're going to have to try. That's the nature uh, of radio. <laughs> yeah. It's just... Like, people, we're watching people dying. We're watching innocent children, men, women dying. You look at pictures, you compare pictures from what Palestine used to look like a couple yes. of years ago to now. There's nothing there. They've bombed all the hospitals. There's no hospitals, there's no aid, there's no medicine, there's no nothing. These people are dying and we're watching that. And our government are, are supporting it, which is great, which, which makes me so happy. It makes me so happy that Rishi Sunak's like, yeah, that's, that's give these people weapons to kill people. It's great. I, I love it. I really, I really love it. I love watching innocent children die. I love seeing it on every social media platform. I love seeing dead babies. I love it. I love seeing dead people. I, love I just need to, just, I, I, I fully appreciate your um, emotion, but I do need to clarify for people who may have tuned in halfway through that you, you are speaking no, prof yes, with, with profound sarcasm. In fact, I, I interviewed 100%. Bassam Youssef yesterday who, who, who adopted a similar position on the television program not long ago and kind of left everybody reeling with, with, with the power of his contribution. But you wonder how anybody cannot feel how you feel i think yeah it's it's it, we're watching and i know a lot a lot of people don't like this word but we are we are essentially watching the genocide of the palestinian people and that's what that's what we are watching we are watching that we are in in front of our eyes that this is what's going on we are watching journalists out of palestine risk their lives every single day uh, how many journalists have died 80 that's that's what's coming out 80 journalists have died Palestinian journalists have died, and now people are paying attention. Now, where were you five months ago? Where were you five years ago? But well, do you? Do, I did say, I, I, yeah. I mean, we're going to start this conversation with 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 October the seventh. I, I, not 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 because I'm trying to close down your points about the broader context and the longer history. I think events in the West Bank right now deserve rather more attention than they're getting. But but you do understand why. The killing of three British military veterans focuses British attention in a way that the previous deaths you described does not. You must understand that. I, I, I do understand it. And it's sad that more people are now paying attention to it because yes. obviously three British people have died. They should have been paying attention to it months ago. And obviously it hits home more to people because these people are British and it hits home a lot more. But it should have hit home when innocent people were dying anyway. And, it should have hit home. And why do you and think it doesn't? Why do you think it hasn't? Because I, I, th I think it's because people will say, well, that's not my problem. That's nothing to do with me. It's not affecting me, so I'm not going to pay attention to it. And that's how people deal with problems nowadays. If it's not affecting me, I'm not going to bother about it. But now it is affecting me because it's my, you know, they're from my country, they're from where I live, they are mm. British, la, la, la. That's when people start to care. But because they are Muslim um, and they don't live in this country and they don't go by this country's Christian views and they don't look like this country, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to them. But because now that people that do look like them and that are British have died, people are like, oh, no, oh, this is atrocity. This is this is so bad. Like, mm. we need to do something about this. Well, where was you last week? 
or a month ago. When well, that's that's, dying, a, that, that's a that's a question only they can answer. Briefly, what 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 do you want the British government to do now? I want Rishi Sunak yes. to stop sending arms. I know it's probably not going to make a huge difference. But it's going to make some sort of difference. America is probably sending 10 times, 20 times, 50 times more. Sending a lot more to Israel than it is to Ukraine, which focuses the mind somewhat, doesn't it? Yes. (laughs) Of course it does. Yes, of course it does. Um, But we need to stop sending arms. We need to support the Palestinians. We need to show support to them. We need to get more aid to them. We need to help them because they have nothing. They have no army. They have no government. They have no money. They have nothing. They have nothing. They have no hospitals, they have no aid, they have no medicine. People are dying. Babies are dying, children are dying. (laughs) Innocent men and women are dying and we're watching that and we're contributing to that by not doing anything. I'm not saying go to Gaza, I'm not saying fly. I'm saying support your local protest. Give money, £5, £2. I've got no money, I've got no money, I'm on benefits. I have a three-year-old autistic child, like, I've got no money, but I give what I can. I give what I can. I give, I give to, two to people who've the got other day. to people who've got nothing. Holly, thank you. You you use the word genocide, which I do um, quite correctly have to pick up on. It's your opinion, and you're perfectly entitled to it. Um, but of course, it is a threshold which neither you nor I control or, or police. It, it ultimately comes down to the. Um, uh, the Supreme Court of the United Nations in The Hague and, and they are currently considering that allegation and have suggested that at, at, at the first glance it is a plausible allegation but many people of course profoundly disturbed by use of that language which is their right as well just as it is your right to use it. Just to, to pick up on one point about journalists, 95 confirmed dead, 90 Palestinians, two Israelis three Lebanese, 16 more reported injured, four still missing, and 25 journalists reported arrested. Um, And that doesn't take into account multiple assaults, threats, cyber attacks, censorship, and even killings of family members. And that that comes, these figures come from the Committee to to Protect Journalists, an international organization, which describes the um, number of journalists and media workers killed, injured, or missing in the war as the deadliest period for journalists since the CPJ, since the Committee to Protect Journalists began gathering data in 1992. And yet it falls to me to remind you that the Israeli government tell us that everything has been surgically undertaken and that the prioritization of civilian life has been unprecedented in the context of conflict and that they have done more than any other uh, army in history to ensure that innocent lives are not taken and I think that a pinch of salt is probably necessary now don't you whatever you thought yesterday and speaking of what people thought yesterday I, I am interested in in how opinions shift and how ideas change and, and quite a lot of you are are telling me that that is exactly what has happened to you I am um, I'll find a couple of the more but more, more more pertinent or sort of best put um, uh, expressions of that. So, like many of us, on October the seventh, the necessity of Israel's response, although it was unspecified, was plain. But most of us had an idea, emotionally if not intellectually, of what too much response would look like, where the line between retaliation and revenge may lie and and we couldn't put it in numbers Uh, for me it was crossed weeks ago for many for for much of fleet street it would appear it was crossed yesterday if it hasn't been crossed by you i don't think it ever will be and that means you're in that space that we started describing in november where you're not prepared to say it out loud but you are comfortable with a limitless number of deaths and casualties in gaza or at least you feel that they are justifiable and justified usually of course by blaming the victims. It's half past ten. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.33 is the time. That didn't last very long, did it? I said I was going to close the gates of Idiot's Corner today, but John's been in touch, absolutely demanding that he gets given a golden season ticket for a lifetime residency in Idiot's Corner during this discussion about the killing of three... British military veterans by uh, an Israeli airstrike yesterday, um, an airstrike that took out a total of seven 
um, aid workers, uh, a, a tiny fraction of the overall numbers of the dead, but a, a, a tragedy that focuses the mind of British people in an unprecedented way. John's got in touch to say, how can you express concern for life when you have a dead animal on your plate? Thank you, John. 10.33 is the time. Back to the phones. Trevor is in Finchley. Trevor, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I think that the incident yesterday is an absolute calamity. Uh, oh, the said, phone uh, line's not very good. Let's give it 10 seconds. If it doesn't improve, we'll have to try and fix now? it. Yes, go on. I don't, I don't know what you did, but don't do it yeah. again. <laughs> no, sorry, pal. It's gone. Uh, we'll try and get you back, OK? Um, Saf is in Telford. Saf, what would you like to say? Uh, you know, there's an elephant in the room here. There's blatant racism going on. I don't know why some people are just scared to call it as it is. I don't think I live in an era where people are scared to call racism racism, Saf, uh, to be honest with you. And here you are doing it. Uh, so so w- where, where do you see the racism in this case? In that vehicle, there's a couple of Palestinian aid workers. Uh, most of them were white non-Muslims. Because only made headline news because of them white non-Muslims in the vehicle. No, it's because vehicle- it's it's they're British. That that's why it's headline news. The the, three, the the faces on the front of the newspapers are. If I'm talking about like the Australian as well and the American as well, you know the whole international. Yeah, but but, I, I'm, but 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 we're not. We're, we're talking about the three British soldiers who are dead. And if they had been black British soldiers, I think the story would be more or less the same today. But, so so it's not actually racism. It's a different form of prioritisation or prejudice, but it's not racism. But if they, if they, most if they people, most they people who haven't seen it, most, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Most people who haven't seen a newspaper today probably don't know the ethnicity of the three dead British people: James well, Henderson, but, John Chapman, um, and James vehicle, Kirby. If, yeah. If what I'm saying is the vehicle was full of local Palestinian aid workers, would it have made that my news? No, because they're not British. Well, that's my point. Maybe not racism. No, it's not racism. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm very. But not at all shy of calling racism when I see it. But that's not quite what what we're describing here. We're simply describing the way in which if a story is in the news about Telford, your ears will prick up in a way that they won't prick up if there's a story in the news about Tel Aviv or Dundee. Uh, We as British people are more interested in the killing of British people than we are in the killing of anybody else. And guess what? Palestinian people are more interested in the killing of Palestinian people than they are in the killing of people from Shropshire. Yeah, I agree with you. So it's not racism, is it? If, if you look at the situation in Ukraine, mm. yeah, and how the international community acted towards Ukrainian refugees in the UK, yeah, how the Ukrainian refugees... Yeah, that's, I, I agree with you there. There's definitely an element of racism in, in the different attitudes towards white refugees and brown refugees, but yeah. that's not what we're talking about today. I'm not beating you up, Saf. I just, I just think that this is such a sensitive issue that we've got to be absolutely clear on our sense syntax and our semantics. What, what, what do you want the British government to do in response, and this helps you understand my point, I think, in response to the killing of these British citizens? I wanted to put international pressure on the war to see, well, to, to introduce an immediate ceasefire and to stop supplying arms to um, to Israel and for the leader of Israel to agree to a two-state solution, which at the minute he's dead set against. Well, I think he's, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's regime has been historically quite sympathetic towards um, Qatar's support for Hamas has been because... Hamas pose a threat to the Palestinian Authority and and share Benjamin Netanyahu's disdain for the idea of a two-state solution. But again, that doesn't get written about very often or talked about very often in the British media. I think think just to support your original point a little, Sands points out that if it is an American, an Australian or a Canadian, then our ears will also prick up and and just nudging towards that racism point. But I stand by what I said. If, If these three men killed in Israel yesterday had been mixed race or black or, 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 or Asian Brits, then I think that the reaction of the establishment would be the same. The reaction of some punters who claim to get cross about flags having their colours changed slightly while turning up at UKIP conventions with a purple union flag, them I can't speak for. 
but front pages of newspapers and political engagement, I think I can. 10.38 is the time. Saf, take care. Trevor's in Finchley on a better line. Where were we, Trevor? Uh, well, I start to uh, uh, James. Uh, um, I agree with your uh, initial comment that what happened yesterday was an absolute calamity. The, uh, the fact that the, uh, the aid organization had given their coordinates to, to Israel and that they were still... Uh, and they were still killed is indeed a tragedy. The larger issue is that how would, should it affect the war? My own view is that it shouldn't. Israel's in a particular state, a situation where they're confronted by an enemy that, are, that to request demands its elimination. They don't want a two-state solution. They want a one-state solution. Well, Netanyahu and, and much of his cabinet doesn't want a two-state solution either. So does that justify their elimination from the other side of this argument? I think you have to look at the history of... Just the answer the question, been, if you would. Sorry, what was that? Just answer. Well, you must know what the question was because you were just about to dismiss it. And, uh, you, I said, to you, repeat the question, James. Okay, so Benjamin Netanyahu and many members of his cabinet are on the record as opposing a two-state solution now. Does that somehow justify calls for their elimination as well? The, 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 two, the, it, 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 the two things don't run together. The fact that they want to yes, do want they do. You, you told me that the justification for the elimination of Hamas, regardless of what the collateral damage to innocent civilians might be, was built upon their refusal to accept a two state solution. That's, so that's I, completely absurd. So the reason that's why what you said. On, so I'm wondering whether Benjamin well, Netanyahu an and. Solution, James. It's, I'm repeating your that's own words the back that's to not you. The reason there's a war. The war is not because they want a one state solution. No, but or, the need to eliminate Hamas is because they reject a two state solution solution you just told me that they've they've launched a genocidal war on israel that is the reason there is a war not because they have a view that they have a one and you've just justified the elimination of everybody in gaza in pursuit of hamas how do you how do you then convey the idea of wanting to demilitarize hamas and remove them militarily because because you're here to justify the killing of civilians who's justifying the killing of civilians who who justifies where did I say that, James? Why are you, why are you inventing... Because you said that you want what's all. happening now to continue, and tens of thousands of civilians are already dead. Ergo, to call for what is happening now to continue, you're calling for the continuing killing of innocent civilians. No. This no isn't complicated, Trevor. They are, how many people have been killed in Gaza? 32,000? That we know 000? about. So, that we know about. The United Nations number of civilians killed to co- competence generally is c- recorded as 9 to 1. That's the UN figure. The number of civilians, the people who have been killed in total, is about 32,000. If you accept that we know Israel's about. Figure, no, James, if you accept Israel's figures of, say, 13 to 14,000 competence... Why would I accept those figures? That is well below Why would I accept what the United those Nations have as a figure. Why would I accept those figures? Well, you'd, you'd rather accept Hamas's figures rather than United Nations figures. You're talking you know, about you're Israel's you'd figures. Hamas's figures are more credible than United Nations. I, I think that Human Rights Watch has detailed the measures that the Palestinian Health Authority takes to record casualties and deaths with reference to mortuaries and hospitals and explained that by publishing biographical details and names, they have a more reliable record than many other comparable conflict zones, whereas you think you should trust what the Israeli Defence Force tells us while refusing to allow foreign journalists into that territory. Just talk me through that. Well, I'd accept the United Nations... Well, the fact that all these figures are going to have to be verified at some time later. So why are you telling you me to trust one and not... No why are you telling me to trust one and not another then, Trevor? Because the United Nations... Well, the 32,000 figure comes from Hamas. You're quite prepared it to... It comes from the Palestinian Health Authority, which the Human Rights Watch have provided objective analysis of. Who provides objective analysis of what the Israeli Defence Force tells you? Or Hamas. So if you're going to... No, put no, one you can't, trial, you can't keep doing trial. this. I've told you what Human Rights Watch say about the measures that the Palestinian Health Authority deploy to list their death toll who provides objective external scrutiny of the numbers that the israeli defense force provides well you either accept israel you're going to have to answer the question at some point who who provides objective international scrutiny of the numbers that you have come on the show to tell me i should i would like to suggest to you i'm going to ask you again until you answer the question because we both know the answer answer. we both know the answer who provides the answer no we don't change well i'll tell you then trevor nobody no, you have well. Either you accept or not accept that Israel's figures are as close as verifiable as possible. Either you can denounce them because it's Israel. But I've just told no. To I've do. just told you that Human Rights Watch are the body to whom I turn for guidance on this matter. Who's the body to whom you turn for guidance on whether the IDF's figures are reliable? Well, the United Nations Rights uh, Human Rights Watch is an organisation that has vilified Israel in the past. Okay, has been so they're, they're biased as well. And so I would, I would. So also, then, then I would we come also, back to this question: Why won't they allow foreign correspondents into the territory? 
I've no idea. You'll have well, to let's, ask Well, them. let's think it through together, shall we? Because here we are arguing about the Why facts. Why is that important to you? Why is that important to having all the... the having, well, having because I believe, in objective, I believe in objective external scrutiny, and I'm intrigued as to why you think Israel rejects it at every turn. I think there are more important issues at the moment. Yeah, but you've rung in, in to talk about these issues, so no, you'll, no, in, also, you'll indulge me. Why, what, you'll why indulge the me government. then, Trevor. Why would Israel refuse access to foreign journalists when people like you are so keen mm. to have objective facts established by trustworthy outside sources? Well, there are journalists there. There are, there are Palestinian journalists there. Do you not yeah, so we there? come back you... to the question. No, no you, you've I, told me that I can't there, trust James. Palestinian figures. There are journalists there. Yes, why won't Israel allow foreign correspondents in? Why won't they allow Katja Adler in or Matt Fry? Why won't they allow Christiane Amanpour in? Why won't they allow people that have visited and reported on every other war zone in the world? I, and you're going to have to answer uh, one well, of I, my I, questions. My answer to you is, have you posed that question to them? Have you posed that question? Has obviously posed that question? What's to the who? answer they've given? Pose that question to whom? Have you posed the question to the Israeli authorities why they won't allow LBC, BBC, Sky, why they won't allow them? Have you posed that question? I, I will when I get the opportunity to ask them, but right now I'm, well, I'm asking sure it's been right, right now I'm asking you. Well, I think it's a, And it's you're the an answer to the question, day. Trevor. This is what you don't realise. See, I, I, You are the answer to the question, because if they allowed foreign correspondents in to provide independent verification, to, to provide international scru scrutiny, to report objectively, you wouldn't be able to ring this program and say the things that you've just said. James, you know what, the, if there were journalists involved with what they would find is that the arms in maternity wars, you see? Uh, guns in pillowcases. Yes, yeah, so then why wouldn't they, let, so you've done it, you've proved That's my point even find. more powerfully. So That's everything, all of the journalists would discover things that completely support your position. So you must be furious that they're not allowed in. No, because I no, because I trust I trust the Go Israeli on. military authorities to make judgments that are right. They've just killed three. They've just killed three their, British their aid workers. You've, the, the people you trust to make judgments have just killed three British aid workers. Before you go, you remember mm -hmm. when they shot three hostages who were wearing their underpants? The Israeli hostages. Yeah, the ones wa waving waving the white people, flags, yeah. wearing yeah, their yeah, underpants, who'd escaped. How's that? What's Everything. the latest on that investigation? from the people that you trust. James, we're in the middle of a war. The fact that every single awful incident, like yesterday... Are you going to answer one we're... question that I've asked you, Trevor? I've no idea if they... I'm sure... But I'm these are the people that you trust. I'm just looking for, I'm looking for the grounds. Ground What's the latest up? on that investigation? Because you're trusting them to conduct this investigation. What's the latest on the shooting of three Israeli hostages by the Israeli James, Defence Force? Wearing their underpants and waving... Wa wearing their underpants and waving white flags. The hostages that we're told and you believe that countless civilians have to die to, secu to, to, why, to why secure you, the release of. Why do you put words in people's... Why do we have to, where has anyone mentioned you're so polluted by your own... and corrupted by your own language? Here you we put go. words into my mouth that I never said. You said that the, the war has to continue. They would absolutely continue because they're And how many an civilians army, have died so far? So that means the killing of civilians has to continue. I can't explain your own thoughts to you, Trevor. You have to take responsibility at least for them. And I'm very happy to do that. But well, except war, you're not, are you? Because you don't want independent journalists in, in, the, in the region. You don't want anybody to believe the figures that are provided by anybody other than the Israeli Defense Force, who you claim you trust completely, while you can't even tell me the state of the investigation into their shooting of the hostages that you claim the release of is the justification for the entire conflict in Gaza in the first place. Why does the UK government support Israel in its war aims? Why I'm do they sorry, do that, say that again? Why, why does your government support Israel in its war aims at the moment? Why do they do that, James? What That's do you a think? brilliant question. What do you think, James? Give me your own independent um, uh, view, objective view of why Israel, England, the British government, is supporting Israel in its aims of destroying Hamas. Why do you think that is? Well, they're not, are they? Yeah, no, they're, they're not, they they're not they supporting. Are. They've called, they, 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 have, they have absolutely they laid they down a red line on Rafa. They They've made it absolutely clear that they don't support war crimes. They've made it absolutely no, 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 clear that they don't support a ground offensive. Aims. That they don't support a ground offensive in Rafa, and they've made it absolutely clear that the unnecessary killing of civilians is something that can't be countenanced. Israel riding roughshod over all of that, absolutely. Again, you make accidentally you make a brilliant point. Benjamin Netanyahu has made the British government look both ridiculous and weak. I think the British government has Hang been Hang on, strong. you're asking me what I thought. Okay. So I'm answering your question. Benjamin Netanyahu has made the British government look ridiculous and weak, just as he has made you look ridiculous and weak. 
Well, the, and the also beat, profoundly wrong. Personal, wish you reject my view. But, but hang on, you just talked to me about pollution. You got you got personal first, Trevor. I, I'm only meeting you no, on I your own battlefield. Your opinion. No, no, no. I haven't. No, I no, I haven't defamed okay. your opinion or anything like that. But the British government. So we'll is, return to the what to me is the killer question, the most crucial question of all. What is Finding arms and finding munitions in a, in a maternity ward. Is that a lie? Well, well you, you tell me. You tell me the journalists that have reported that. No, you've just, you've just boldface said it was a lie. So obviously you yes, have evidence. Yes, you, you, you tell me the journalists that have reported that. You tell me the journalists that have reported that. Or have you taken that from the same people that killed the three British aid workers yesterday? I take that from the video evidence of the army who have gone in. The video, say that again. Have, say that again more evidence. slowly. The video evidence that who? The, the video evidence from the Israeli army, okay. from the Israeli soldiers. So there we are. The hospital, and that's the answer to your question. The they can't hospital, let yeah. journalists in because then people like you wouldn't be able to take videos filmed by the actual soldiers killing the civilians as truth, would you? Well, from your position, James, anything Israel says is obviously always going to be wrong. It's which is why you need independent journalists in there. Which is and why you need independent journalists in there, Trevor. You see it now, finally. So you're accepting Hamas's figure. Which no, you're saying I'm accepting a human rights you're, watch's you're analysis of how the Palestinian Health Authority assembles its figures. No, you're, you're, and you are reminding everybody listening why journalists aren't allowed in by Israel. Because you wouldn't then be required to rely on footage filmed by the actual soldiers killing the actual civilians, Trevor. But here you are, live on the radio, saying it out loud. James, you can tr you're very good at contorting, distorting. I'm not, that's Trevor. I'm game. very that, good at holding skill. up mirrors and repeating game. people's James, words journalist. back to them. You're, you're, you're an excellent journalist, but you use it to create... I'm very good at repeating Israel. people's words back to them. Without you, Trevor, I'm nothing. Um, it's 10 to 11. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Seven minutes to 11 is the time. Seven aid workers dead, three Britons. You can trust those figures because we've got their photographs. They were working for an international aid agency. You can trust those figures because you can see their faces. Um, what do 33,000 faces look like? There are lists of names available. As I mentioned to our last caller, Human Rights Watch has uh, done some fairly extensive work into the measures that the Palestinian Health Authority, which is run by Hamas, um, undertake in order to ensure that their figures are as reliable as is, as is possible in the circumstances. But I, I, and I don't know that sympathy is quite the right word, but if you can't answer the question of why Israel won't let proper journalists into Gaza, you can't really claim that the stories they put out um, instead are reliable. That's the way it works. Robin's in Windsor. Robin, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, hi, James. Good to speak to you again. I think I spoke to you last about uh, a military officer joining a, a aid march in London. Oh, um, yes. That was you. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, firstly, you know, my condolences to those, um, to those military guys. And, you know, if I was 20 years younger... I would possibly have been with them because, you know, I'm so quite frankly upset about what's going on. Let me there. pause but, you there. Know, let, 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 how, how likely is it that these lads would have undertaken this job, at least in part because of sympathy for the Palestinian cause? Or would it, and I know we're speculating, no, but, but you are a former o o army officer, so you know more about this than I do. I, I, uh, I've done humanitarian work in, you know, wars right. in Bosnia and also in the Middle East before. But, you know, it's not really about, you know, who the people are as much as what's being done to them and, yes. and what help they need. You know, it's a, you know, I've looked at it right from the start, you know, from, you know, day two, day three, when, you know, Israel started dropping non-precision, you know, 4,000 pound bombs on 
you know, uh, blocks of, of civilian accommodation. While, while, while insisting, really while insisting that they were precision attacks. So again, I oh, think or, it's important. Or, or it's that, in, yes. The reason there were, were casualties was because Hamas was keeping everybody there. Yes. Meanwhile, Hamas are living in tunnels. So what's the point of, uh, of you know, destroying basically all of, you know, Gaza above ground when we know that you know, Hamas is living below ground? I mean, I don't get the logic there. And as the, you know, no, the but in the absence of in the absence of, of foreign correspondence, then you can put out these lines and people are free, of course, not just to swallow them, but then to regurgitate them. The, the problem comes but, uh, you when know, they're one, challenged. You know, I have to say, on the one hand, you know, I, I've been perversely impressed, to be honest, by the way that the Israelis have been able to sell this to us all. You know, in terms of, you know, the the reason that people have been killed or, you know, the I mean, you know, they'll, they'll another military advisor will come out and go, you know, we're the most moral army in the world you mm. know, and we take every precaution and they just keep pumping that line. And you know, Netanyahu yesterday, and I detected a sort of smile or smirk on his face. Yeah, I'm going to you know, again, we, forgive me, I'm interrupting you quite a lot, but you know how it works. I, he had yeah, also he was also giving an update on his. Um, uh, his recovery from an operation for a hernia. So I, I, I okay. think I think the same conference covered quite a lot of ground. And and having, you know, come out of hospital yeah. okay. after a successful operation, he is allowed to smile. I'm not here to defend much no, no, I, much I, I, that I, Netanyahu no, that does really or the point. no, of course. It wasn't really the point. The point is what he said, which was yeah. you know these things happen in war, you know, and for sure they're not going to be investigated. The issue now, of course, is that you know people like Biden and Sunak and you know the Tory government and. You know, uh, the Americans, you mm. know, cannot, because we've got three Brits killed now, they can't just sort of wave it all away anymore because it's, it's peaked a lot of interest today. And people, you know, saying, well, hang on a minute, what is going on here? Why are, you know, aid workers being killed? It better have been, you know, three Palestinian uh, vehicles. Yeah. I don't think that, you know, it would have been brought to our attention and we'd have got an Israeli spokesman would have come on and gone, yes, well, we thought there were Hamas vehicles in the area uh, and we mistook the intelligence and blah, 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 blah. Same old, same old, you know. Look, war is, is a complicated thing. You know, uh, yeah. you know, as an ex, you know, British soldier, you know, I, I want to believe in my whole heart that we would never have gone after, you know, a, you know, a, a, an organization like Hamas embedded in a, you know, in a, uh, in, an, in, in, in a place like Gaza in the way that the Israelis have. I mean, they just basically destroyed it, you know. And, 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 well, and, it's, and, and it's not over yet, which is why the last call was, I think, unintentionally chilling, because the support for this to continue, more civilians to die in the tens of thousands, more aid workers to be killed as a form of collateral damage, more journalists to die, the... the, the, the Palestinian based, the Gaza based journalists who um, uh, were there when it started, because of course the uh, determination to keep out foreign correspondence remains a crucial part of the, um, uh, the, 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 the program that Robin describes, the ability to get talking points out there. Mick's been in touch to say, I can't believe you're talking about this and not the beheaded babies of October the 7th. Again, look that up, Mick, look that up. It's um, a, a claim that reached the White House. It came out of the mouth of Joe Biden, and yet the evidence to support it is non-existent. There isn't any evidence to support it, I, I, which is, I mean, the question of why the atrocity of October the 7th was not atrocious enough in and of itself is one that I can't answer. Why on earth would you need to embellish or, or exaggerate details of something that was objectively disgusting? I don't know the answer to that question. It's coming up to 11 o'clock. Um, the question of what the British government should do in response becomes, I think, ever more acute. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. A again, clarity is important when the difficulty of getting independent journalists into the Gaza Strip is so, so acute. Um, uh, foreign correspondents who've reported from every war zone in the world prevented from getting in there. The number of journalists dead, uh, uh, record-breaking, as we've seen. And actually, the number of um, aid workers killed so far is, is also unprecedented. But the killing of three, and I'm not, I don't know if defending is the right word, but I am unconfused and untroubled, in a sense untroubled, by the mathematics of concern. Uh, obviously, British media, British people, British politicians care more about the killing of British people than they do about the killing of non-British people. Um, 
I guess that if you're asking how you can care more about the killing of three British people than you did about, do about the killing of whatever figure you prefer, 20 or 30,000 Palestinian civilians, I, I, it becomes a little harder, perhaps, to explain. But, but, but it is... It is what it is. Um, Haaretz, which is a, an Israeli news outlet, um, and others have undertaken investigations into to, to what is called a kill zone, just on that question of the of the death toll. And they have spoken to uh, Israeli soldiers and, uh, and and former reservists who describe. Well, here's a quote from one. Actually, here's a reserve officer who has served in Gaza. In practice, a terrorist is anyone the IDF has killed in the areas in which its forces operate. So, a host of reserve and standing army commanders have talked to Haaretz, casting doubt on the claim that all of these, and they claim about nine thousand of the thirty-two were terrorists. Um, they claim that they were terrorists. They imply that the definition of terrorist is open to a wide range of interpretation. It's quite possible that Palestinians who never held a gun in their lives were elevated to the rank of terrorists posthumously, at least by the IDF. I, I, I mention that only because if you're going to take the IDF's figures while questioning the Palestinian Health Authority's figures, because it is controlled by Hamas, then you have to have a really clear answer as to why Israel won't let independent verification or, or, or journalism into the zone. Uh, five minutes after 11 is the time. Here is the UK Foreign Secretary, because we live in a country where failure is rewarded. Uh, this man has come back, having led the country into the madness of the 2016 referendum and inflicted austerity upon these islands. Uh, David Cameron gets given a seat in the House of Lords and a plum job in the Foreign Office by Rishi Sunak, which I suppose in the interest of balance, you have to acknowledge he is not proving quite as useless at as he has his previous positions. Turning to the situation in Israel and Gaza, uh, the dreadful events of the last two days are a moment when we should mourn the loss of these brave humanitarian workers, including the three British citizens that tragically uh, were killed. We should also send our condolences uh, to their families and our thoughts should be with them. Uh, I welcome what the Israeli Foreign Minister said yesterday to me about a full urgent and transparent inquiry into how this dreadful event was allowed to happen and we want to see that happen very very quickly. I also welcome the fact that he spoke about much more aid getting into Gaza, up to 500 trucks a day. That is essential. We've been promised these things before and this really needs to happen including longer opening times at the vital crossing points. But of course the extra aid won't work unless there is proper deconfliction, unless aid can be taken around Gaza and we avoid the dreadful incidents like we see, we've seen in the last couple of days. That is vital and Britain will be watching very closely to make sure that that happens. Thank Foreign you very much. Foreign Secretary. Um, what, what does it mean, really? Uh, how closely do you watch these events? How, how likely is it that this signifies a, 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 a sea change? I think I've seen reports already that Joe Biden is ready to send 50 F-15 fighter jets, even in the aftermath of what's happened in the last 24 hours, worth about $18 billion. The UK, of course, continues to supply arms, although I think on a negligible, close to negligible scale. I could, I could be wrong about that. And, and public opinion, of course, has, um, uh, has abandoned Israel long ago, thanks to the actions of Netanyahu and his closest allies. So what, what, I did two questions here, really. What, what will the government do? Answer, I, I fear nothing. What would you like it to do? Answer, 03456060973. I, I mean, a feasible, meaningful, talk a lot about sanctions, don't we, in the context of everything from water companies to misbehaving youths or, or internet providers, you know, the big uh, social media companies. They won't do the right thing unless they will suffer more from not doing it than they will from from doing it you know the 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 idea that you can only really get people to do the right thing by in, uh, exerting enormous pressure on them i don't i don't see sunak or, or cameron doing that there's a couple of tories who've already criticized cameron for not being full-throated enough in his support for benjamin netanyahu's offensive in gaza and of course they'll be quiet but for how long? 
they'll be quiet today. You see the three hostages who were killed. It's an extraordinary story, that, which, again, was reported uh, in, in uh, muted terms. Three, three hostages who had escaped or, or eluded their captors removed all of their clothes in order to prove that they were not, for example, carrying suicide vests waved white flags as they, with enormous relief, approached IDF soldiers and then got shot dead. That was the last thing that the IDF was going to mount a full and uh, frank and transparent inquiry into. Uh, and maybe they have. We just didn't, didn't get the results. Haven't looked in the right places yet. Nine minutes after 11 is the time. So what do you want the government to do? Realistically, what do you want the government to do and what do you think they will do? The British government, in response to the killing of three British citizens by... An Israeli airstrike, an airstrike that was deliberately aimed at an aid convoy. You can already hear the sort of backpedaling and semantic quibbling. It was deliberately aimed at an aid convoy. I mean, those words are extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. And, of course, if you were to be really um, cynical, you would wonder whether the prevention of aid which perhaps explains why david cameron was talking about the importance of ensuring that aid gets in there aid aid agencies are pulling out now because they're not safe now who who might possibly be celebrating that it's not going to be palestinian people might be hamas of course because it's likely to prove another recruiting siren for them the, 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 the graver the privations, the bigger the death toll, the more indiscriminate the killing appears, the more likely Hamas is to enjoy a recruitment surge. And I think that elements of the Israeli regime would be celebrating as well, because if you think that everybody in Gaza is guilty, if you think there are no innocent people in Gaza, which has moved ever closer to the mainstream discourse now, here and in Israel itself, then... Why have any aid at all? Steve's in Bodmin. Steve, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, James. Hello, well, I hope I can uh, relate this calmly. I, I have two takes on, on this, which I said to your producer. The first is that this is the IDF's AI system gone rabid. It's a system that has been developed to deliver the maximum amount of ordnance on the maximum amount of targets which, of course, it wouldn't be able to do if it wasn't supplied with the munitions from the United States. Um, I believe that the system has been nicknamed in Hebrew or translates as the gospel. So, so that, that was one thing, that it's their AI system, automated system for attacking moving objects, and it's just out of control. Right. The, what the are you second, basing this on? I mean, I, I'm always slightly wary of people who've done their own research, but th th is this a field that you've worked paper. in? Or? Okay, no, no, you've read it. You've read this, have you? It's a okay. newspaper report. It was, no, no, none it was, of us, none of us can few, read everything. A few Steve. weeks ago. Okay. It was a few weeks. Uh, no, probably a couple of months ago. Okay. Yep. But and the, the second, second thing. The second thought is that it is 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 depressing and distressing to contemplate because it is so unconscionable, and that is that they would deliberately target an aid convoy to put off aid agencies from helping the people of Gaza because they deliberately want them to starve. And that is a frightening and depressing thought. I don't know how to respond to that. I'm going to be completely honest with you because my instinct is to push back. And yet, after that conversation with Trevor, I, I find myself wondering whether we're all actually victims of the... Uh, strangling of objective news reporting and we're all victims of the unleavened diet of the IDF's version of events and so I, 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 I all I can say is that I really hope you're wrong and I think you do too I do too I do too but uh, it's not the first time an A convoy has been attacked there have been all sorts of attempts to thwart aid getting in and I, I know that the Israel, Israelis do not want to supply Hamas with anything that could be used in their war against mm. Israel. I fully understand that, but, 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 but the death toll to civilians, and we are talking 70% women and children, are we not? Yes, by, I think by, so. By, well, by I, I, any yeah, account, yeah. UN or, or, or Palestinian Authority or Hamas, whoever, that, that's a rough 
roughly consistent number, I think. It's, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy, and it is being funded by munitions companies. What do you want the British government to do? Well, they should have done what... They should have stopped support. They should have called for a ceasefire a long time ago. The ceasefire did seem to yield some results and release some hostages. And it could have gone on longer. Maybe more hostages would have been released. I'm sure there are a lot of Israeli families that would have liked to have seen that outcome. But that didn't happen for whatever reason. We've had a UN resolution passed in pursuit of a ceasefire now. So the idea that the... um the idea that the that the Israeli government um, is going to be heeding heedful of of calls like that is non-existent now, really, isn't it? Perhaps so. It's what two, three weeks since they they so made that. back to that question of how it ends, and God only knows the answer to that. But how much agency the UK government has, we're probably a little bit delusional about a delusional, delusional about a little bit of sort of British exceptionalism, a touch of the old Suez condition where we think we're a lot more important than we actually are but I, america in an election year could could turn out to be the key factor in all of this how many die until the dust settles i do not know quarter past 11 is the time james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it is 17 minutes after 11 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where I, I wonder whether this needs to be added to the mix as well. You, do you know who Alicia Keynes is? Um, a relatively moderate conservative MP by which these days you just mean not absolutely crazy. You know, if, if, if Brendan Clark Watsits and 30p Lee can become deputy chairman of the party, then goodness knows what the standard is for, for sanity within the ranks of the parliamentary conservative party. But Alicia Keynes is chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. It's quite a big job. And while we were all celebrating Easter, she um, revealed, it was, I think, a a clandestine recording at a Tory party fundraiser. She said that the UK government has been given legal advice by its own lawyers that Israel has broken humanitarian law, but had essentially chosen not to announce it. Um, The... Specific law, I think, is the one that insists countries must deny the exports of our... Well, I, 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 this will be the law regarding the passage of aid in, into Gaza, probably. Um, but there are various other areas in which the allegation may stand. South Africa, of course, having its case heard at the International Court of Justice, having accused Israel of, of genocide. But, but Alicia Cairns, I mean, these are words I can't believe I'm saying. The chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, not some sort of fringe weirdo, but the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee has claimed government lawyers have told the UK that Israel is not complying with its international commitments, but has not disclosed this and continues arms export, uh, exports. This, this follows warnings that famine is now setting in in Gaza. So the importance of aid is greater than it has ever been. And one of the responses to the killing of the aid workers by the IDF yesterday is the withdrawal of agencies from the provision of aid because they don't feel safe. What does that tell us? That tells us that the people on the ground in Gaza don't believe Israel when they talk about intelligence failures or unavoidable consequences. That tells us that they don't think that this is a freakish aberration. I think it does. Perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm reading too much into it. But these aid agencies know that risk is a routine part of their existence. For them to reach the point where they think that risk is untenable, that risk is too high, surely suggests to any fair and honest observer that this particular attack on this particular convoy to them speaks of much more than incompetence or intelligence failure. I, 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 you tell me. I, I'm not an aid worker in, in Gaza who risks their life already but considers that this event has rendered that risk unbearably, untenably high. 20 minutes after 11 is the time. And I'm trying to think of other contexts in which the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee revealing or claiming, whatever you prefer, that the government's own lawyers had told the actual government that Israel, which continues to receive arms, military support from us, arms exports, that, that, that Israel had violated humanitarian law, human rights law, uh, under, the, under the analysis of our own lawyers. 
So what do you want the government to do? 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. 21 minutes after 11 is the time. Sophie is in Ealing. Sophie, what would you like to say? Oh, morning, James. Hello. It's a real pleasure to speak to you. Oh, um, and I, hope I know so. we're not allowed to be emotional, but you're, you're my hero. Oh, stop it. Thank <laughs> um, you. Um, look, I, I mean, there's so much we can say about this, uh, this mm. topic, but I, I'm just going to um, just think, think about the killing of the three servicemen. I think what, what that's done is uh, it's really... The British government has been allowed to kind of look away and make excuses for Israel for, for a long time, um, it, just because I think it, it's aligned to the US and the US has a certain position. And um, But now that three... British uh, um, aid workers and, and servicemen have been killed. They, they can't. They're forced to now address the, the issue. Um, because I think, with, with, you know, before this happened, 70% 70, 70 of the British public, from my understanding of, of sort of media information, were in favour of a ceasefire. Um, and I think if, if the British government didn't take this stance um, and, and be really quite firm about it... And, yeah, and, wow, and, what day and, is it? It's Wednesday. I, I mean, do you... Will, <laughs> Will they be hoping that it's dropped off the news agenda by Monday and that, and that you know, Netanyahu continues doing what he's doing now and, and we, 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 we continue to well, watch elements of the world object and other elements wave it through and ben, Joe Biden continues to send fighter jets and we continue to, to send ordinance? I don't know. Well, well, I don't know. The, this is the horror of it all. Um, you know, it, the idea that you can, you know, the US sat in the, in the UN... Security Council and and abstain from uh, from the ceasefire for the first time, um, but then the next day they sent arms to Israel. Now, what does that tell you? Now, words are cheap, but mm. actions speak much louder than words. And so we have a situation here where, where and, and especially in light of the leak from uh, the Alicia Kern. Yes, uh, were you aware of that? Yeah, I, 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 I yeah, I heard about. Um, I, I read about it. It's mad the, how the, the, the day in which something comes to light can have such an impact upon the amount of coverage that it gets, isn't it? It's crazy, really, in a twenty-four-seven well, universe. But well, here we are. What is the point? This was leaked, I think, a few days ago, yes, it but it, it now has much more force because of the situation we're in now with the three servicemen. But my yes. fear is this: well, the British government now is, you know, now that it's now that this has leaked. I think it's going to have to take very seriously. It's going to have to really consider the legal advice it's been given because I because I, I do mm. remember that. I don't know if you remember that uh, the select committee where um, uh, where Lord Cameron was being questioned by Alicia Kearns and she asked him if he'd had legal advice and he denied it. I don't know if you remember that. That was that was a while back. Um, no, and I don't remember that, but I do think I've seen some footage of. Um uh, uh, the, the the Prime Minister, I forgot his name for a minute, of Rishi Sunak being asked about it. I'll see if I can dig that out. I, and, and that's since yeah. Alicia Kearns' claims at the weekend were made public. So what's the point of having government lawyers if, if they are not um, exactly. lawyering? But also, this is about the fact that this has gone to the ICJ. The ICJ has is investigating the matter. It's, it's, it's said that there's plausible... Uh, there's plausibility of genocide. Um, and then we have uh, the British government, who if historically have, have a connection to this story. You know, we're not going to go into that. Okay. But, uh, you know, and now, now um, it, it does the British government really want to be complicit with the killing of, you know, of, of, of aid workers, of children? I don't know if you... I know this, well, this has the, shocked the, the, the British government, but... The British public have been shocked by incubators with babies that are, you know, that are yes. dying. So, so I think that that's one aspect. But, I, but cynically, the, your earlier caller said, you know, is this a deliberate thing by Israel? I, I really do think it is, and it's shocking. And I think the impunity that the Israeli government have, I think they know that no matter what, because they've got the backing of of the US and, and the British government, even if they do the worst things really, really, what is the world going to do? Nothing. And they know that. So if they push the aid workers out, which is their tactic, because don't forget that they, the, the shooting of the aid trucks, that's still being investigated. I've seen propaganda suggesting that there is no famine in Gaza and, and, and footage yep. filmed elsewhere in the world or at different times in history of, 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 of kebabs and restaurants. And the, the, the yep. I think we had a little flavour earlier on the programme of, of the mindset that's desperate to believe that stuff while ignoring the fact that proper journalists aren't allowed in. It's a, it, but So it's out there. The, 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 the permission to deny that famine exists is out there and it's being sold by the Israeli government in some cases. 
Yeah, and, and you look, the UN order to increase aid last week, UNRWA have been banned. They're banning Al Jazeera journalists. Don't forget the, the Israeli government, if they're going after Hamas, why are they killing journalists? Why are they, uh, you know, going after hospitals? Why are they killing doctors in the chest when they're working? You know, there, there's so much that is going on. It's to really, um, it is to destroy the whole infrastructure of that place is to get is to lose all of all hope no aid who's going to send who's going to go and help in gaza when when they're going to get killed you, you know don't and, forget and there are there there are people in the cabinet who would already um be calling for for gaza to be settled then by by israelis i i, I mean I, I wish some of this wasn't true because it, it 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 sounds almost incredible it sounds almost too much to be plausible but but these people exist and they increasingly as time has passed have said things out loud that um that would once have sounded a bit fanciful or speculative and and sophie's exactly right and of course if you're uncomfortable with anything that she said about doctors being shot or about babies in incubators or about famine or about um, uh, any any version of events that you don't like as a supporter of Benjamin Netanyahu or, or just as a good person who doesn't want to believe the worst, um, then you have to wonder why they won't let Matt Fry of, or, or into, into Gaza or, 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 or Katya Adler or Lise Doucette or John Simpson, you know? Why? You have to ask yourself that, and you have to answer it as well. That's a bit harder. It always is. 27 minutes after 11 is the time. Um, just to clarify one thing that Sophie said, the uh, International Court of Justice made a legally binding order last week. This is what she was referring to. She knew what she was talking about, but just in case you didn't. And this was as a consequence of famine setting in. It's all part of the case brought by South Africa in uh, accusing Israel of genocide, an allegation, of course, that Israel stringently denies. Mark's in Belfast. Mark, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Hello, mate. What's on your mind? James, it's it's actually quite infuriating that uh, my taxes, along with uh, the, the rest of the British taxpayers' monies, are being used to send weapon systems to slaughter innocent people, is how I see it. Um, Sunak needs to get a backbone and get off Joe Biden's back. Don't follow the US. They they love nothing more than a war. Uh, cut Benjamin Netanyahu completely off and issue a warrant for his arrest. Uh, the genocide and war crimes that that man is committing is absolutely abhorrent. And how anyone can defend him um, and his country's position is beyond comprehensible, to be quite honest. When did it become behind, beyond comprehensible? Because on, on October the 8th, it wasn't, was it? Or October the 9th, or, or, or arguably November the 8th. So when did it become? I know this is a crass well, question. Be... I'm addicted to this question. I, I, I don't know why, Mark. I just, I, I, I guess I, sometimes I'm as guilty as anyone of looking for simple answers to yeah. complicated questions. But when did it become untenable? When did it become... In my opinion, James, yeah. it, it was untenable from day one. Okay, uh, fair enough. I mean, it's an answer. Yes, it was. It was horrible what the what was inflicted on the people uh, of Israel by Hamas. But at the end of the day, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, to go in all guns blazing and to level uh, an entire land, uh, killing innocent people, is not the answer. Um, it certainly doesn't fix so anything. So provided proof that you were taking every conceivable measure to avoid civilian casualty, we'd have been comfortable with, uh, with, with, with any number of Hamas, proven Hamas, or even genuinely suspected Excuse me, have no. Hamas operatives been killed? I would have been. I, I, I go after the people responsible for the October the 7th atrocity. But your, your position would be it became clear very, very quickly that they were simultaneously telling us they were being really, really careful and taking no care whatsoever. The fact that they're not allowing any outside media um, yeah. into the country to report tells us everything. Well, should tell us everything that we need to. They're honest, want honest, to know. objective media. I think they, 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 they yes. I think there might be a couple of shills that have been allowed in. I'm not sure. I, I don't think what he's doing. My personal opinion. I don't think there's any difference between what he and Vladimir Putin are doing. Um, but yet, the UK, and the US, and other nations uh, around the world uh, see Ukraine. one as acceptable uh, and one as unacceptable. There's no difference. 
Well, again, you are entirely free to say that. I, I don't need today to agree or disagree with it, but the um, some of the parallels are acute, some of them less so, I suppose. I like this. As a, a member of the Jeremy Bowen fan club, I just listed off the top of my head some of my favourite foreign correspondents. You, you, someone's tempted to say, please don't forget Jeremy Bowen. You're absolutely right. I, I, I absolutely would put Jeremy Bowen very much in the middle of that list and also a much younger contributor to, to, to this discourse, Secunda Kamani, who... Um, I, I applies his trade over at Channel 4 News doing amazing work. And speaking of people doing amazing work, have a listen if you get the chance to Krishnan Guru Murthy's um, conversation with the latest Israeli spokesman um, on Channel 4 News last night. It was remarkable. And if you wonder why I say the latest Israeli spokesman, um, I'll tell you. I, I, I don't know if you remember a guy called Elon Levy who was popping up all over the place not long ago, um, including here, not this program. Um, uh, and there's some confusion about who he was and how he ended up being uh, an Israeli spokesman. At the Times of Israel, he's been suspended and, and I think is no longer a spokesman after essentially accusing the British Foreign Secretary of lying about the passage of aid into Gaza. Uh, the Times of Israel, and I'll retweet this article, has done an extraordinary investigation into how somebody can pop up on every television station, radio station in the country with no background. Or, or, or particular, it's an extra, and it's an interview with him, so it's not even speculative. But you know, sometimes I find myself listening to programs all over the British media and thinking, "Who is this chap? Where did they find him? Who, where does he come?" And this answers that question quite spectacularly. Uh, there is no particular qualification process, or, or, or all you've got to be able to do is publicly defend absolutely everything that the Israeli government does, regardless of context, evidence, and. Um, and disputable facts, I suppose. So it's by a journalist called David Horowitz in the Times of Israel uh, uh, under the headline, The Stunning Rise, Curious Suspension and Insistent Return of Israel's Star Spokesman. An extraordinary piece, which I'll share with you imminently while you uh, enjoy the very latest news headlines with Thomas Watts. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. And the time is 24 minutes to 12. It's an, I mean, I'm in, in, inundated with calls today, understandably feelings running very high. Uh, but I do want to nudge things, if I may, towards the question of, of support, the question of where your pendulum has gone on this, the horrors of October the 7th, so, so blatantly vile that I think many of us felt, uh, 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 if you like, an emotional commitment to the idea that Israel has got to do something and it's got to do something big and it's got to do something fast. And I, I make no apology for that response. But its dissipation or dilution is fascinating. It seems to me to be feasible that people could have undergone a 180 degree conversion now. You, you, you could have gone from, well, of course, Israel must do something to how the hell can Israel still be doing this? Israel must do something to Israel must stop. And I'd love to talk to you if you're in that category. And, and, I, and I'm going to trust you to be honest with me. Okay, so, I, you know, I get some messages. Here's one from Bob. I'm not questioning your, your sincerity, Bob. I just, I, I'll read the mail. My sympathy for Israel was lost in October when water and power was cut off straight away. These are war crimes already. Uh, then medical aid, amputations without anesthetic and the mass bombing of buildings. They, they have lost any moral high ground a long time ago. I just would question politely and kindly how much sympathy you had for Israel in the first place. And, and but maybe I'm being unfair, but you see what I mean. I, 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 luckily, I get recorded. You know exactly what I said in the immediate aftermath of the October the 7th attacks. And I think, understandably, I came in for some criticism for, for being quite full-throated in my belief that Israel not only um, had the right to respond robustly, but needed to respond robustly. I stand by that. But I started asking the question of how much is too much almost the next day. I think most people have now answered that question, or, or rather, most people have now seen with their own eyes, or read with their own eyes, or heard with their own ears, uh, the answers to that question. So, uh, how do you process this as somebody who who feels the the the, the, the visceral relevance of the modern state of Israel, who, who feels the, the 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 links to the Holocaust, who who, who has always, or, or perhaps as in my case, who needed some help 
fully to understand uh, the importance, the unique status of the modern state of Israel in the context of sanctuary and safety and generational trauma. I, I, it may be too early to ask the question of of you as as to what Netanyahu has done to you. Uh, when, when we had uh, Noga Tarapolsky on yesterday, the, the um, Israeli-based journalist, I, I, I shared with her a phrase that someone else had shared with me off air and, and taught someone who is very, very committed to the modern state of Israel and just said to me, and it was the phrase that I remembered was 60 years of goodwill. He said, Netanyahu has squandered 60 years of goodwill. And I repeated that phrase to her, expecting some pushback yesterday, and she agreed. I, I don't think that that the I don't think that the business of processing that fact has probably started in earnest yet for many people. The the squandering of goodwill, the sacrifice, if you like, of goodwill, the the support that Israel, whether you like it or not, and I quite like it, enjoyed in much of the world. Because it's the, the, the necessity of its existence and its survival is different from that of other sovereign states. Uh, I, I believe that. I can't justify it intellectually. I can justify intellectually most of the things I say on this program. For me, this is emotional. Emotional and historical. The, the unique status of the modern state of Israel as a space of sanctuary for a people who have endured millennia of persecution culminating in the Holocaust, but peppered with pogroms and murders and, and myriad other modes of persecution. Uh, I, not quite uniquely, I think that the Roma merit similar treatment, but the numbers, of course, are, are, are much smaller. And, and I, I still subscribe to that. But how on earth you sustain unquestioning support now for what this man and his acolytes have done is, I'm afraid, beyond me. It is beyond me. Um, 41 minutes after 11 is the time. There's two articles I keep meaning to tweet. I, I, the, the one about the uh, the guy that was everywhere 10 minutes ago as an official government spokesman. I've just retweeted that one. And I, I should put out that Haaretz article as well about the, um, uh, the, the, the kill zones in Gaza and the reasons to be profoundly skeptical of the claims by the Israeli army that 9,000 terrorists have been killed since the war began, um, increasing evidence or testimony from defense officials and soldiers that these are often civilians whose only crime was essentially to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, Abby's in Kensington. Abby, what would you like to say? Hey, good morning, James. Hello. Um, first time caller. I've been listening to your show since I moved to London. Oh, um, thank you. So, I just uh, I'm just trying to understand. So, Israel, UK, and other Western part partners mm. have a solid partnership. Now, my question is, what do you get out of that partnership? What is, for example, in this case, the UK? What do we get out of that partnership? That allyship, that friendship? Because I thought when we're in a partnership, whether that's business or, you know, personal, there's checks and balances. There's certain things that you cannot do, right? Like mm. Cheating, um, lying, deceiving, killing. Um, at what point does the Western powers or Israel's partners say, look, man, this is enough is enough. Like we've, you've done enough damage. When does it stop? I, I, I think I think that your your question is very very powerful, and I don't know whether it's rhetorical or not. But but the answer is is being lived. There is no answer to this question on on a statute book or or, or on paper or in a you know a, a, a convention. That there is <clears throat> there is no answer to this question because Netanyahu is testing the limits of what you describe in a way that Thank they you. have that they have never been tested before. Thank you. Yes, and. And 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 these three victims, um, British citizens, are not the first aid workers that have been deliberately targeted or killed. I mean, there's. I think the number is something around 196 uh, aid workers that have been killed yes. by Israel. 
Um, I remember, I don't know if you remember a few years ago. I don't, I don't know that, that, that they were all incidents of deliberate targeting, uh, but, but the number we'll I think know. is, no. No, but we, we'll we, 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 we will know that some of them definitely weren't. Yeah. Look, uh, what I'm saying is, do you remember a few years back there was a young American woman who was bulldozered by the IDF? Yes, of course I do. Has anything come out of that? Has any been anyone been punished? Nope. The answer is no. So, but to my to, to is, my to my shame, I can't I can't nod along with that. I don't know for sure that that is true, but I, 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 I'll, I'll take your word for it. I can tell you for a fact, no one has been. Uh, prosecuted, nothing has happened or come out of that. Um, it was just a, she happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, um, which is extremely sad. Um, mm. But the point I'm making is whether these three victims, I'm sure other, we'll find out about more victims. And, and the frustrating part is nothing is going to change. Not that these three British victims are worthy or, or have, have more value than the 20 or 30 some thousand folks, civilians who've been killed, uh, whether you want to dispute the numbers or not, nothing is going to change. My point is nothing is going to change until you put your foot down and you tell your partner, you hold them accountable and you say, look, enough is enough. This is what's going to happen from now on. Mm. If Russia has done that, if any other government has done that, um, you would see immediate actions. And let me say one more thing. Um, um, well, I think in, in most other circumstances, we'd probably already be militarily engaged. It, you know, <laughs> the, so the, 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 the parallel doesn't quite work, but you're talking about if an enemy was responsible for the killing of British aid workers, then the response would be very different from that when an ally is responsible for the killing of Britain, which is in a sense, Abby, a statement of the bleeding obvious, isn't it? But, but I understand the nuance of the point that you're making. Yeah. And, and it's, I, it almost feels like now, I don't want to sound a, like a conspiracy uh, theorist, but it almost sounds like, I mean, we both know Israel has carte blanche. They can do whatever they want, especially with Joe Biden. Well, you do, and I don't like glossing over that. I, I mean, it, it, it is increasingly difficult to push back against that claim. Is, 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 I mean, to the point perhaps of impossibility, especially when you hear from people in the Israeli government or even their supporters in, in, in the UK media who don't seem to think there is any point at which their mission becomes unsustainable or unsupportable. Whatever happens, they will support, usually by pointing out the necessity of eradicating Hamas or freeing the hostages that they haven't shot themselves yet or, 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 or that, are, that are still alive. So, so there, it's not quite as, as glibly acceptable as you describe it. There, there, are, there are, you know, some grounds put up for justifying the continued carnage. I would yeah, say. Yeah, I, I dispute that. Yeah, I, I know totally you do. Disagree. I know you do. But um, I, I'm putting up, I'm putting up the, 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 the thing to be safe. disputed. I think what you're doing, James, is it, with, with all due respect, mm. I think you're playing safe. I think you're being Oh, I, no, I'm not playing safe. I, no, I think, I think we've gone beyond the point where, where Israel's impunity is arguable. I'm just reminding you that people still argue it. And the argument is yeah. we need to eradicate Hamas and we need to rescue the hostages. I, I think that became... I think that became spurious months ago. Let 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 alone completely um, ridiculous. So I'm not yeah, I'm not I'm not playing safe. I'm just I'm just putting forward points that perhaps people will be a bit shy of ringing in to make themselves and reminding you that those points are in the discourse. Yeah, it's it's just absurd. It's really yeah. sad and scary. And the thing is, um, Palestinians, um, because you have. Christian Palestinians, you have Jewish Palestinians who've been there like forever. Um, it's so I, earlier you were saying how Israel is the sanctuary for Jewish folks, and, and well, that's part of the answer to your original question about why why yeah. it, it, why are Western governments, why is the UK and America in particular um, uh, putting up with this, as it were, and I think that is part of the answer. I do, I do think it's a lens through which you have to view this. This, I'm short of time. I should have talked less. So, just yeah. conclude your point, if you would, and then I've got to go well, to the, the new. To the, the point. The, all I want to say is that, um, look, Jewish folks have been 
persecuted for millennia, as you said, yes. in Europe, yeah. not in the Middle East, by Europeans, well, guys who... Yeah, I mean, again, I don't, well, I will let yeah. you finish, but I mean, you need to read the Bible. <laughs> that, that wasn't set in Europe, mate. Yeah, but... <laughs> well, there's no yeah, but about it, is there? The, you know, uh, but, but mate, mate, co- conclude your point. Let's part as friends. Cause I, the, the, point, the point I'm making is that they they were not persecuted by Arabs or Muslims. They were persecuted by European guys since Spain, Catholic Spain. Yeah, in the context of the last 200, in the context of the last two or 300 years, the idea that Arabs should have to make way for the, for the guilt assuaging creation of Israel is, 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 is a point that you're right, you're right to raise. Doesn't change how I feel. And that might be because of my background. That might be my white privilege kicking in, Abby. I don't don't know what your ethnicity is, but I, I, you know, I, I, I could perhaps, See it very, very differently through Arab eyes. 11.49 is the time. Um, I, I, I think, well, I know Abby was referring to Rachel Corey, of course, a, a, an American um, activist who, who was in the International Solidarity Movement, the pro, pro-Palestinian organization, and was crushed to death and killed by an Israeli armored bulldozer in, in 2003. It's 10 to 12. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.53. We will uh, wind this conversation down a little, Um, although I do find myself wondering now, what on earth were you expecting to happen? This idea of waking up this morning and suddenly go, oh dear, this is bad. Where where have you been for the last (laughs) several months? What were you expecting to happen? How many aid workers do you think um, uh, have, have already been killed? I think it's about 196, at least on the 20th of March. I, Abby referred to this a moment ago. It was 196 humanitarian workers killed in the occupied Palestinian territory since October the 7th. That comes from the Aid Worker Security Database, which no doubt someone will be popping up soon to tell me, oh, they can't be trusted. No one can be trusted except the IDF. Um, who not only kill British aid workers, but also shoot Israeli hostages who are waving white flag. But hey, I mean, why wouldn't you believe everything they put out? And of course, it's perfectly normal to to ban foreign journalists from that area because we can all completely rely upon the information sources that, that are coming from there. Oh, and look, here's an official spokesman who goes on Twitter to accuse everybody of going on a Palestinian peace march of being a rape apologist. That's all perfectly normal behavior as well. But you wake up this morning and you go, oh, dear, no, we've really reached an impasse now. Something's got to change. I mean, the tragedy is you're right. This is a a game changing moment. But quite what change it affects, only time will tell. John's in St. Paul's. John, what would you like to say? Uh, Well, yeah, my dad was in concentration camps. I'm very angry about what the Israeli Defence Force, I would actually say, because my father was in concentration, they are behaving worse than Nazis. They are beyond the limits. They well, they're, they're, no, are I, they're, listen, psychopaths. No, I, you, you forced me. You forced me people. to interrupt you because they are not rounding people up and and putting no, them in on them. trains and putting them into anyone. gas chambers. No, you can't. I mean, listen. No, I, no, I can. It, it, no, you're going no, to have to let me speak. You're going to have to let. Yeah, you're entitled to this view. Them. I'm just, for the record, stating I find it. I find it repellent and ridiculous to claim that they are worse than the Nazis. Not least because, I, and I know I'm your dad was, but that minimizes the whole. Was there. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. But guess what? I back myself to, to hold the opinion that I hold. You, you can hold yours, but well, I, I can find I can find it obnoxious, John. Can't the, I? The, the government uh, and the uh, Starmer and Sunak are gutless, they're immoral. They are supporting this. What we've got is the same situation as the Second World War where the press back the the people committing the atrocities. And well, well again, there are atrocities committed on October the seventh and historically by Hamas as well. So it's not quite oh, as binary a, a parallel as, as that isn't the timeline. The timeline is actually before that when I just said and his, I just said and historically as well. I don't, I don't want I don't want this conversation to descend into into sort of interruptions no, of interruptions of interruptions. Tell me what you want. It, okay, so tell me what you want the British government to do. Stop military aid right now. But also, you realise our defence forces could be active in uh, actually providing the aid. And basically, if they were in there, they should be allowed to defend themselves. And, and this is the problem: the UK and US. Well, you can't defend yourself from a missile that's been fired from a drone, can you? 
No, but they, you, oh, if you had something like the SAS in there, they would be embedded, uh, hidden, and they would be able to use anti-aircraft if uh, an anti-tank guns. But basically, this so is what be, Israel be, needs to know. We'd be deploying British, British service personnel to fight against soldiers no, equipped with no, British no. supply arms. What they would do be is defending right, aid workers and guaranteeing that Palestinian children do not starve to death. The object of this... Uh, uh, the, to kill these aid workers was to stop the children from being starved to death. This is why the parallels are with the Holocaust. And, and, and I've said you can make that point, and I, and I, I, I reserve my Netanyahu right to reject it. He's okay? trying to save himself by just killing people. Yeah, He's I'd agree with that. Himself. Even I, the Israelis recognise that yes, now. I'd, I'd agree but, with that, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the destination where, where, where you've ended up, John. Thank you for your call. Um, I, I don't know if I can squeeze anybody into the limited time um, remaining, not on a subject as... Uh, well, let's see. Terry, can, can you use a minute constructively? Yes, I think I can. Carry on. All I wanted, all I want what the British government to do, I mean, they can, they can, they can go for, to, to, to take the, a moral view because the amount of, of uh, weaponry they're actually providing mm. Israel with is pretty minimal in, comp- in comparison to what yeah. they provide generally. I would like a recognition that what's happening in, in Israel is part of a long-term strategy by, by the Israeli government, not just Netanyahu, he's, just, he's, he's part of it, but there's, there's a strategy to actually take the whole of Palestine, the West Bank, the lot. They're going to make Gaza uninhabitable. Virtually is Great, now. Greater Israel. I've, I've seen a map of Greater Israel with a with a with a, a senior supporter of Benjamin Netanyahu standing next to it. it. Even had the Kingdom of Jordan in it. So that's what you're describing, well, yeah. I think. Well, yeah, and, and this and this and this. I mean, I, I know you've avoided the his, the, histor- the historical context to, to to a degree, but this goes back to 1898. I mean, when the first the first Zionist Congress. And you go back to people like Jabinski in, in, the, in the 1920s and 30s. They wanted Jordan then as well. I mean, I'm not suggesting they want Jordan now. But no, nor, I am I. Suggesting, nor am I. Well, I am suggesting but they want more than, than, than they, they want uh, Israel's. But well, to look, the border to the, from the river to the sea is in Likud's uh, manifesto literature, but, election but what, literature. But what I'm saying is that, is that the British government and the media, especially the, the, the Tory press, rabid as they are, mm. need, uh, need to be honest with the British people and say that... that they know this. They know what's going on. This, you know, Hamas provided provided Netanyahu with it on the plate, and I can I can I, I can't understand why anybody slaughters. But when, when you think of all the years of repression and the fact they're basically being caged, you know, you, you have to you have to look at both sides and then the history. And, going and, and, and uh, yeah, you you have used your minute constructively. If you would just just for the record, I know you told the producer a little bit about your own family background, Terry, which I think would be helpful in in this moment. If you could just share my that. my 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 grandfather and my great grandfather were 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 fleeing Jewish repression. Um, they came over and into this country, you know, back back at the turn of the century. So, so you know, my, my grandfather was a, was a was a was a practicing Jew, a refugee, a refugee. Yeah. Thank you. It is twelve noon. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after twelve, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I, I mean, we touched on uh, transgender people yesterday didn't we with the conversation about the scottish hate crime laws i should probably have brought you up to date in case you didn't know already jk rowling will not be prosecuted it, it, it turned out that the um the, the twitter um avalanche that she uh, published over the weekend did not constitute in the views of police scotland a breach of their new hate crime laws but inevitably the the the, the merest uh, mention of the subject saw me come under concerted personal attack from people heavily allied with both extremes of that particular conversation and such is such is life on we go um and then we've just done two hours on the possibility that that israel is um now moving into uncharted territory where it will not enjoy the support of its historical its historic allies as a consequence really of benjamin netanyahu's apparent contempt for palestinian life which is i think it's fair to say um not uncontroversial in perspectives so and i just want to say thank you to everybody who's who's got in touch to say nice things about the um my attempts to navigate this incredibly 
incredibly tricky territory, um, uh, including one that I've lost, but a particularly powerful message from, from Israel, from a friend of one of the, the, the fathers of one of the hostages that were shot, but, but David and, and Christine, and um, a gratifyingly large, Christina, I beg your pardon, a gratifyingly large number of others. Um, thank you. I do, it does matter sometimes, particularly on days when you can feel the, 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 the ice thinning beneath your feet. I am going to turn your attention next to a story of almost comical irrelevance in the great scheme of things, but one about which I think you really care. I wonder if you can guess what it is. Let's play a game. All right. I'm going to tell you about something in a minute. At the end of this introduction, I am going to back myself to have secured a significant majority of people currently listening to the program knowing exactly what we are talking about. It is something that has got measurably and remarkably worse in the last 10 years or so. Okay. It is something that is incredibly boring when other people tell you about them, but which is incredibly important, not to say fascinating, when they actually affect you directly. And when they do affect you directly, it can have uh, a, quite a considerable financial cost. It can, um, can, can, let's see, let me get the WhatsApps up. Remember, you can WhatsApp me now on the usual number, 03456060973. It's not flags. Alex has already had a go. And it's definitely not Brexit, Chris. Honestly, we never talk about Brexit on this program. You got me mixed up with someone else. So look, let's make a list. It's got, it's, got, it's got massively worse in the last 10 years. And in fact, I think it's got progressively worse. So it feels to me as if this issue has got worse. Fair play to Kieran, who's texted everything in category. Ah, oh, wow, we've got a win. Okay, I'm staying with it. I'm staying with it. It's got progressively worse in the last few years, uh, as in it feels as if it's even it's getting worse this year than it was last year. It is by definition, and according to the laws of physics, it is a problem that gets worse as long as it goes unaddressed. So here is a problem that is quite big, but if you don't fix it, it will get bigger. Do you know what it is yet? Okay. It is expensive to remedy but more expensive not to remedy. And it is linked to, here's the clincher, it is linked to the broad topic about which we famously never talk on this programme, with uh, uh, occasional exceptions, of which the next hour will be one. So let me have a look at some of the wrong answers. It's not online scams. It's not the cost of vets. It's not care homes. It's not oh, quite a few online scams. It's not the price of cheese, Gareth, but thank you for playing. It's not the fact that your favourite fast food restaurant, Greg, allegedly waters down the cola that they are selling. Ken in Kennington got it right. It's not dating. It's not race. And it's not the French, Jacob. Um, I, 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 slightly jingoistic approach. It's not dental care. It's not climate change. And Alan, it's definitely not sex. It's not the NHS. Brian got it right. Vincent got it right. It's not parking tickets, Rena. It's not funerals. Another online scams. It's not politicians, Marilyn. We talk about that all the time. Ben in Stafford got it right. It's not electric cars. It's not dentistry. It's not homelessness. It's not music. Uh, Adam Foster got it right. Gareth got it right. Paulie got it right. I'm good at this. So now I, I would say by far the most popular suggestion is the correct one. And I didn't give you that many clues. And you can tell how good I am at this by the number of people who got it wrong. And indeed, the variety of wrong answers. Football season ticket prices, says Stan. The Tory party, says Peter. Food security. Water and sewage, says Carol. It's something that I don't think we've ever talked about before. So now I'll go back to the top of my inbox. Good Lord, Keith, how many messages have we got? I'm getting a repetitive strain injury on my rolling finger here. To get back to the top of the inbox, it's something that I don't think we've ever talked before and is linked to the subject that we never, ever touch on on this programme. Now we're getting there. Now it's... Ha OK, so Anna got it right. Angel got it right. Uh... It's not my waistline, John. I talk about my waistline all the time and my hairline. Uh, Kenny in Liverpool got it right. Kevin got it right. Um, you getting close, but not no no cigar. Sarah in Shropshire got it right. James got it right. Uh, yes, there's a lot going on here. I, everyone's got it right now. And I believe Michael has challenged me 
Mike in Rugby suggests you can't seriously be about to talk about this, James. Well, Mike, I think you'll find I can. And I will. How many potholes do you think there are in the UK right now? Should we have another game on the... I can't, because it alienates people who aren't joining in via text, email, and... uh, Actually, I never look at my emails. Via text and WhatsApp. How many now do you think they reckon they are? Who counts them? I, apparently, you start with 5,000 holes in Blackburn, Lancashire, and then work your way up from that. I don't know who counts them, but I imagine that most councils have a, a, a running roster of road craters. That's a better word than pothole. I think pothole is one of those words that does a little bit of harm to the issue because it sounds quite cute. It's like pot belly, isn't it? It's like that scene in... Um, what film am I thinking? I'm thinking of Pulp Fiction, aren't I? And if you call it a pot belly, it can sound quite cute. You call it a pot, oh, it's a little, little leaky pothole. It's not, it's a road crater. It's a road, it's a crater in the road. Um, so the number of road craters in need of repair reported to councils. So that's how they count it. Um, although the uh, number crunching has come from an insurance comparison site, confused.com, if you were wondering. They reckon that... W- well, I don't even want to tell you. No, because you're not even getting close. It's not 300,000. It's definitely not 11. It's not 40,000 potholes in the UK. Uh, Shane had a guess at that one. Quite a lot. And some of you have obviously seen the story. You're not. It's definitely not one and a half billion, James. I don't think you're taking this entirely seriously. Um, and, well, that's an arguable point from Amir. It says it's one, James. The entire UK is one giant pothole. 2,526,245, says David. That's extraordinary. No, that's wrong. Um, it's not 2 million. There are currently 1 million road craters in need of repair in the UK. The southeast of England is the worst area for potholes, uh, with just under 200,000 being reported there last year. Now, I, I think we've played enough games together now. Why do you think I suddenly care about potholes? Can you can you work it out? I'll give you a clue. The weather has improved a little lately, and therefore so have my habits. Let's see if anyone's got that right yet. Uh, so I, I have become, in the space of the last week and a half, I have become acutely, indeed keenly aware. Stop sending me numbers. It's a million. It's one million. Craters in roads. Oh, people might be listening on catch up. Sheila's going to be getting people sending her numbers. Tom will get people sending her numbers. because People forget they're listening on catch up and get involved. Um, Matt's got it right. Uh, Matt has got it absolutely right. Well done, Matt. I have started riding a bicycle to work. Now, ad- admittedly, it's one of those assisted bicycles. It's 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 an electric bicycle. I, I favour the Lime bike. I don't know if you've got them in. I mentioned this on air, didn't I, to, to, to a fella in Scotland somewhere because I asked if they had Lime bikes where he was. So, well done, Matt, but that's not amazing. Um, lots of you getting it now. Yes, I am cycling into work. No, I'm not joking. I am cycling into work now um, if the weather's not too bad. I'm working my way up from a lime bike which are great value they're they're quite expensive the first few times you use them but if you start if you're going to use them a lot and you get passes rather than paying per ride and also download the app yourself don't don't use it via uber because it costs a lot more if you use it via uber um, than it does if you download the app and get passes and I, I i'm working my way up i mean the, the plan is that by summer certainly by the end of summer i'll be on a proper bicycle I just I, the problem with proper bicycles is that they get nicked. I've had bicycles nicked left, right, and centre over the years, and with a line bike you can just park it, and it's it's no longer your responsibility. You've got to take a picture of it to prove that you've parked it responsibly. And Bob's your uncle; you're away. So I've started using bicycles again, and having not been a regular rider of bikes probably for about five years, I would say, give or take. I cannot believe the state of our roads. Did you ever go on holiday to Spain in the 1980s? Do you remember going on holiday to Spain in the 1980s? Did you go on holiday to Spain in the 1980s? I went on holiday to Spain in, the, in my dad's Morris Marina. We drove all the way from Kidderminster to, uh, to, to, Spain, to the Costa Brava in Spain. Drove all the way through France, crossed the Pyrenees. It's a very happy holiday. But I remember being struck, and, and I was very young. I'd probably only be eight, nine years old. 
I remember being struck by the state of the roads in Spain. In, in, I think they may have been unmetalled in places, like but, but only one or two notches up from a track. And these were the main roads. These were the, ro- the only road you could take to get to wherever it was you were going. And I remember being struck by the, the, the state of the roads. I think we're, 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 we're like 1980s Spain now. Roads on continental Europe are extraordinarily good. I must stop saying extraordinary. I've just got a real affection at the moment for that first syllable of it. Second syllable. Extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's like when Paul Merton went through a phase of saying, isn't it marvellous? He was going, isn't it marvellous? Sometimes a word settles on your tongue in a way that it's quite hard to get rid of. And I'm like that with extraordinary at the moment. So because I'm riding bicycles, I cannot believe how many potholes there are. And I'm covering quite a lot of ground. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm coming in from from b- 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 deep west London, and that's why cycle lanes are such a brilliant idea because they're new, which means they haven't got potholes in them yet. But the state of the roads, I cannot believe the state of the roads. So this could be part of the reason why I've never liked motoring subjects. Because I've never really been a big motorist. If I was a big motorist, I'd probably be less dismissive and condescending about people who are obsessed with parking tickets and um, and, and traffic wardens and various other parking-related and road-related issues. So I, I've, I've, got, um, I've got a couple of questions. The first is this, and, and I know that the, the short answer is because they, they're not being fixed, and the reason why they're not being fixed is because they're expensive. But this seems to me to be such a false economy that I want to know why. Why has the pothole pandemic, as I like to call it, why has the pothole pandemic in the UK gone out of control in the last four years, specifically the last four years? So the, 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 the numbers now are the worst they've been since 2020. So what has happened? Why has the pothole pandemic gone out of control? control 0345 606973 and then the second question is what are we going to do about it people who know more about roads than i do which is pretty much everybody including some people who are still in nappies people who know more about roads than i do how, how is this ever going to be fixable does there come a point of critical mass with potholes where the road is more pothole than road and therefore filling in the potholes is you're still going to... Do you see what I mean? Have we reached, with the pothole panda, have we reached critical mass? So two questions. Number one, I'd have thought quite easy to answer. How has it got so bad? Why have we got a pothole pandemic? A pandemic of potholes. 0345 6060 973. Number two... What are we going to do about it? What do you think local authorities paid out last year in compensation for people who've had their car damaged by a pothole? Have a guess. Go on. Have a guess. So if I said to you that it was just shy of £25 million, do you see what I mean? About And that's every year. So how much would it cost to fix things? Less than £25 million a year, probably, because once it's fixed, that number comes down and down. So why are that? What's happened? 03456060973. And what are we going to do about it? I am I'm tempted to add a third question this hour, but I don't want to dip my toe into a motoring-related issue and have it bitten off by your boringness, all right? But has anybody got a very good pothole-related anecdote? Because, oh, it broke my rear axle and it cost me 400 pounds. That, no, 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 no. Put your phone down now. But I can't, and normally when I'm asking you to come up with the goods, I can give you a vague idea of what the goods might look like. But I've got nothing here. If you think your pothole-related anecdote is interesting, that's far from a guarantee that it is, but it's a starting point. So let's begin there. You think your pothole-related anecdote is interesting. And now, crucially, you've looked deep into your own soul and you have concluded in all sincerity that other people will also find your pothole-related anecdote interesting. That is the bar you must clear to get on the programme today. Question one, what, what's happened? Why are our roads more pothole than road? 
Question two, what on earth are we going to do about it? 0345 606 0973. And question number three, the quest for the engaging pothole-related anecdote. But remember, the acid test on this quest is not whether you think it's interesting, because that's the first rule of motoring phone-ins. Everyone thinks they're interesting. And the second rule is, nobody is. So you have to honestly believe in your heart of hearts that your anecdote may be interesting to others. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 23 minutes after 12 and we are playing with fire. R radio fire. I do have a slightly troubling image of someone tuning in for the first time in the last 10 or 15 minutes. And, you know, you miss two hours of, I, I, even though I say so myself, you miss, you miss two hours of extraordinary conversation about the, uh, the killing of three aid workers and the broader ramifications of that for Israel and beyond. Uh, and, and yet you turned on at 10 past 12 and you heard someone talking absolute bilge about potholes. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound. Frank's in Carlisle. Frank, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, oh, yeah, Frank. so on the one hand, I think there's a lot that councils just aren't being funded properly. I mean, we've seen a lot of them going bankrupt. This is true. And uh, they're not spending enough money on, you know, services like this. Um, I've got my MP and my, you know, I've got a Conservative MP and the Labour person who's campaigning are both talking potholes. Uh, and it's a load of rubbish. It's like they're national level MPs. They should be. <laughs> they should be talking about funding the council so the yeah. council can do potholes. My yeah. MP's actually taken a list of all of the potholes in the area. Fantastic. Compiled it so that he can report it to the council. Um, but the big one I want to talk that's, about. Is that, that, my... that, uh, that's a good story. Yeah. That is a pothole related anecdote. It's not, you see, this is what happens. I think you're going to phone me up and tell me about a specific pothole and your relationship with it, and I'm going to die of boredom. But well, your your MP <laughs> has now got a, a, a hit list, a pot list, a pothole list. It needs, it needs a catchier title, doesn't it? A pothole roll. The pothole roll, pothole roll call. Pot roll call, pothole roll. The pothole roll. The pothole roll. And, yeah. And trying to, t to turn it into a nap. Well, it is. The thing is, Frank, you may be able to float above this nonsense. But if you hit one this morning and it broke your car, your vote would probably be up for grabs. Doubtful. But, yeah, um, I mean, I do have a pothole-related anecdote. Oh, go on. Specifically to me. Yes. Um, it's not the one where I hit a pothole, because that's boring. It's but there was one outside you. my house. Yeah. So I thought, right, I'm going to report it to the council and, find, you know, and, and yeah. get, it, get it fixed. So to do this, you have to go onto the cumberlandgov.uk website uh, where you have to provide photographs, uh, the precise location. You get asked, are you there right now? Can you give us the what three words address, current location, plot it on a map or give us a street address? I sent about three photos and everything that they asked for um, and they came and fixed it in a week. But if I wasn't... You know, if I wasn't tech savvy, there's no yeah. way I would have got through all of that. I wouldn't have got past the second page. So, so on the one <laughs> hand, you're very impatient with the political wave uh, bandwidth being used up on pothole-related issues. But on the other, when it's outside your own house, you're on the phone to the council in a jiffy and you're filling in all manner of technological requirements to get it fixed in, in a week. Well, absolutely. I'm you're doing, a I'm NIMBY. Following, I'm following the rules. You're no, a no, NIMBY. Look. No, no. Yes, you I are. Went to my, Don't I care went about poles. They're not important until they appear on my own doorstep, in which case it's the single most important thing going on, and I want the council to address it immediately. Oh, that's harsh. I mean, I think I went to the council because they're the local council. Fair what enough. I don't want is my national MP. Didn't Rishi Sunak get a photograph filling one in? Or isn't did that I, illegal? Did, did if, you're not, if you're not licensed, isn't that illegal? Can we get him locked up for that? Rod Stewart did it. Yeah, so, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger there's a, did it in America, and he got in trouble. There's a jeopardy for you. You can you can get Rishi Sunak arrested for filling in a pothole, but but Rod Stewart would be arrested as well. I don't know what you're doing in those circumstances. No, I think he was with official people uh, uh, at the time. Um, I, I don't even know if you're joking when you say this. Jonathan Gullis has a pothole patrol, but that's not even close to the top ten reasons of why I won't be voting for him, says Andy in Stoke. Mike's in Taunton. Mike, what have you got? Interesting anecdote or, or other pothole-related content? Well, it's, it's a big, the bigger picture, James. Oh, so, good man. Uh, until good recently, man. I, was, I was the councillor in charge of roads in Somerset. Um, I resigned at the back end of last year for two reasons. One was that 
Uh, I was fed up of working 40 odd hours a week for £34 a day. That's what you get as the uh, executive member for transport. Um, and I, but I was also fed up of, of the frankly hopeless task of trying to stay on top of the, the whole job. Yeah. Um, we're very good here in Somerset at filling in potholes within the legally allotted time. But Which is six months, there, isn't it? Is it six months? <laughs> no, it's a week. It's a week. Okay. Once we know about it, we've got to fix it within a week or we'll... Well, that's not happening, is it? Call. That's clearly not uh, happening. Yeah. It is here. We pay out on something on about three percent of all the claims we receive because we're so quick at fixing the potholes. But the reason they're there, yeah, yeah. The the reason the potholes are there in the first place is because highways maintenance, the resurfacing, the money for it has gone through the floor over the last four or five years because the vast majority of the council's budget is now spent on social care. So we're responsible for nine thousand people here in Somerset, roughly uh, children and adults. And that consumes about 70% of the whole revenue budget. And the way that we keep funding that cost, and it goes, it's massively increased over the last few years uh, in terms of the number of people and the cost of delivering the service, yeah. you just hammer the highways budget and everything else. That's why parks, leisure, museums, all of that's getting hammered across the country so that we don't end up in the same situation as councils like Woking and Birmingham. And, and uh, this is problem. go, this problem's not going to get easier any time soon unless there are significant... In, well, you need a proper root and branch change to the, to the funding and provision Absolutely. of social care, really. I don't think increasing council tax would touch the sides, would it? It would just be a postponement of the problems you're describing rather than a solution. It will get worse. So, uh, you know, it, the, the proportion of money that the council used to get from central government... Uh, as a grant was was more than half, and now that's entirely gone. So we're just left with things well, like that's fascinating. things and and all the rest of it. But before I go, James, can I just well, say, hang on? You'll uh, go when I tell you you can go, Mike. Well, it's not every day I get a former head of roads something <laughs> from Somerset on the line. But go on, you you speak first. Well, I was just going to say my my invitation to take you gliding Somerset still stands. I'm waiting for your call, James. Oh, so well, I'm, th- I'm thinking of moving there now, seeing as I'd be a lot safer on my bicycle than I would be otherwise. I mean, what what is the, and I don't want to make light of any genuine tragedy, so I may well regret asking this question, but what, what is the worst thing that can happen as a consequence of a pothole? Well, I, I think cyclists are particularly vulnerable to exactly. potholes, and, and I, I think there have been incidents, or not in some set that I can recall, but there have been incidents in the UK of cyclists hitting potholes and dying. Um, there was also there was an incident in Kent, I think, recently, where um, badly maintained road signs were implicated in a coroner's case uh, in the death of, of a couple in a car. So, you know, these things have real-world consequences. They, they, they are important areas of council funding that need to be properly funded. But, as I say, it will get worse oh, until government, government properly grasps local government finance. Do you know, you're a wonderful example of, of public service I, I, I you know the the, the 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 sincerity with which you speak about these issues and they're issues i take the mickey out of quite routinely but only only in jest only in love but you're right these things really direct that's why you become a counselor isn't it it's a, do you know what what was your official title when you were when you were in in the job so I was the executive lead for transport and digital, uh, and I really enjoyed doing it. But it just not, it wasn't a terrible position to carry on. I'm still a councillor, but I'm a, I'm a, a, a humble backbencher. So, well, I, yeah, I'm going to give you one of these. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening no to way. James O'Brien on LBC. If you Boom. build it, they will come. Seriously, you deserve Thank that you. much. I can't believe that. No, well, I, I mean, it, you know, your, your your commitment to the role. We take a lot of time to mock politicians who couldn't give a monkeys about the people they're supposed to represent, normally at a national level. But there you are, a councillor. Reach the end of your tether with the scale of the job in front of you as head of digital and roads, but still there doing your bit and put, making a really powerful case, non-partisan case, I should stress as well, which is important in this case, that council funding... Um, is 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 the next massive iceberg that the good ship Great Britain is heading towards, isn't it? It, it is. I'm got a little tear behind it. Oh well, so have I. Now you've said that. They see. That's a, that's a proper reaction to the reward of the the award of the radio. So Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.34. I'm going to take the W here, I think, as the kids say. Um, uh, The Baroness of Amsterdam, which I don't think is an official title, but it is at least a Twitter handle, says, for goodness sake, you have to stop this. I'm now tearing up at a potholes phone-in. That guy really did deserve a Ray Liotta. Yeah, you're right, he did. That's why he got one, Ray Liotta. Um, If you're just tuning in, it's all gone a bit odd. 
I'm looking for interesting pothole-related content. I could have done that at 12 o'clock. Could I have just said that? Give me a call if you've got some interesting pothole-related content. I think we all know we've peaked. No, no one's going to top Mike, are they? Former head of roads in Somerset Council, he brought all the detail, all the knowledge that you need. If you genuinely have an anecdote about potholes that you think other people will find interesting, give me a ring and we'll explain why you're wrong. Uh, or tell me why we've got so many. I, I, I mean, the, the, the cuts in council funding, obviously, are the massive part of the answer. But it seems like such a self-defeating thing to do, doesn't it? Glenda... Well, Glenda, you're interesting for two reasons. Number one, you're about to tell us something interesting about potholes. Yeah. Number two, we didn't think we'd get any women calling in on this. Oh, <laughs> right, okay. So no um, pressure, but you speak for you speak for women everywhere, Glenda. <laughs> just 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 like Daily Mail columnists claim to do. What do you want to tell us? Well, um, James, I live in the country, so we've got a country lane, which is a single lane. Yeah. And, um, and to be honest, the, the potholes are appalling. I mean, it's just, it, 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 they're just so big, they're like craters. And um, what prompted me to call in to you to, uh, today is yes. um, last, last night, um, our particular lane is um, a route to the hospital, so oh. we get some... Um, we get uh, ambulances coming down with their blue lights flashing now and again when um, because it's the it's the quickest route for them to come down to the hospital. And it just so happened last night, um, an ambulance came down about midnight last night um, yeah. with its blue lights flashing, and I thought, oh no! What were you and doing then, up? What were you doing up, Glenda? It's oh, way past my bedtime. Oh, I was watching this tennis. <laughs> but oh, anyway, fair enough. No, good yeah. answer. Carry on. Yeah. So anyway, so um, the, the ambulance came down, got to, uh, got to the end of the road, because I can see all the way down the road from, from my house, hmm. got to the end of the road and couldn't get through. Um, and what, so of thought, the, but because of the road crater? Because, yeah, it's pretty big, yeah. And also they got a sign there because it floods as well, so the road's pretty poor. But anyway, so the, so they've got this sign. So whether he thought, oh, I can't get because it was pointing. I better the not risk it. Whether, I better not risk it. Uh, he thought. Yeah. So do you know what he did? No, he no idea. Back. He backs back. It took him about oh, a good twenty minutes backing all the way back up the lane because they couldn't turn around. Oh my god! This room. is quite serious. So they, yeah. So anyway, so they back back with the blue lights flashing. Luckily, nothing else come down the lane. Otherwise, then that it would have caused a problem. And then he backed back and he he backed into the farmyard because my entrance to the farmyard, um, and he can turn round from there. Right. So he backed into the farmyard and then went and went on but his way. And then he had to find another route to the hospital. Well, yeah. I mean, even the other route is a bit of a long way round, but obviously they decided that's well, what they would do. I, I mean, I, I mean when the, what we actually get, we get more news coverage of mythical ambulances not being able to get through when Just Stop Oil are protesting or things like that. They're always yeah. queuing up to say, oh, what if an ambulance couldn't get through? We get more coverage of that, which hasn't yeah. happened, than we do of, of your road crater. Sorry, what? Hello? Yeah. It'd be interesting to know, um, you what? know, how emergency, emergency what, that what was. Do? You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how what, they got on. What, but, but, but what, what, how, the, how big is it? Just, just in terms of like from one side of the road to the other, or, or and how? It's, di- it's, it's just really deep. Have you been in um, it? Well, yeah. I've, in I've dry not, weather. Lucky. Yeah, I've got I, I've got a four wheel drive. So, but what is it? Where is it up to? If you were, if you were to put your leg in it, is well, it up? You know, to... there's been a lot of cars that have, have, have their wheels um, punctured. You know, and they've had to change the, their wheels. There. Um, because, but it's just got worse over the last week, I think. Um, so um, last week, this is know, quite live yeah. coverage from Medway, Glenda, isn't it? Yeah. This is our Glenda yeah. live on the ground in Medway. It's Glenda. What um, what have the council said to you about it? Actually, funnily enough, like yesterday lunchtime when I came home, I yes. saw the pothole guy from yeah. the Medway council. He's a busy and man. I said to him about it. I said to him about the, the pothole. I yeah. said there's a massive great pothole down there. So presumably, you know, something might get done. Keep us posted. Knows. Keep us posted, Glenda. Yeah. You're yeah. now you're my official okay. Medway you're my official Medway pothole correspondent. I'm not joking. If it gets fixed, I wanna know. I wanna hear about it. All right? Okay, yeah, we'll see how we get on. How deep we? is your pothole? Thank you, Glenda. Is that a song? How deep is um 
It's only half funny, isn't it? Because there's nothing funny about an ambulance not being able to get through, unless blowhards on the radio are making it up in order to attack environmental protesters. But there's nothing funny about that. That actually happened. Where's the Daily Mail when you want them? All right, need them. All right, want to point out their hypocrisy. That's a genuine case of a hospital of a of a of a um, ambulance not being able to get through. Sean says, "Please, may we have pothole pothole hour once a month, James? This is hilarious. No, absolutely not." Uh, I, no, because it, it's only funny because it's it's rare. It wouldn't be fun. so. Yes, it's only funny because we're we Do you know what we're doing? We're actually defying the genre. We're we're a, taking a meta approach to the radio phone in by doing a topic that other radio presenters apparently think is interesting, and doing it from the point of view of it not being interesting, which somehow conversely and not to mention perversely makes it interesting. That's why they pays me the big bucks. Simon's in Sandhurst with some pothole-related content. Simon, what would you like to say? Oh, a story from a number of years ago. Oh, um, that's great. I, it's not even current. Glenda was living the story as she spoke to me, Simon. She could, at any moment, she could have fallen into that pothole, but here you are with some heated up, second-hand, ancient history pothole content. Carry on. Let you down already. Yeah, and yourself. Uh, so, I... <laughs> said pothole, went over the handlebars on my push bike, broke both my arms, thought I'd take it to a no win, no yeah. uh, fee solicitor type person. Um, they took it on, um, and ran it all the way up to the day in court, apparently. And they'll only do this if they feel they've got a yeah. 55% chance or better of winning. Um, and I got handed £4,000 and I asked the solicitors, well, you didn't go to work for nothing. What did you get? And they said, close to 15,000 and if they wanted to run us into court on that day yeah. then they would have suffered another close to 15,000 pound for their barrister to have to go in to defend it so, so you 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 settled on the steps of the court yeah pretty much yeah. and their fees well, your legal fees which yeah. were on a no win no fee basis were 15 grand you walked away with 4 grand and two broken arms and the council is in the hole for nearly 20 yeah, I wouldn't have had to go to court. They rung me when I was on the holiday in Greece. And they pretty oh, much paid nice. me on the day. Um, how did you go to the toilet when you had two broken arms? Um, <laughs> it was four days before Christmas. I was supposed to cook tea for 20 people yeah. and to answer your question with great difficulty because my wife was not in the slightest bit interested. No, that's not a proper answer, is it, Simon? But I, I sense that's all I'm going to get out of you today. <laughs> it is. It's not funny. Well, it is funny, but it's not funny at the same time. There's nothing funny about having two broken arms. Uh, Thomas is in Hove with some pothole-related content. Thomas, what have you got? Hello, James. Hello, um, Thomas. I'm a highway inspector. Oh, um, go on. So I deal with potholes all day, really. Um, both, I, I, I have you got a favourite? Well, some potholes are, like, haunted. They just seem to be in a... At one particular place for no apparent reason, and you, they just keep coming back. You, so can't, get, you can't get rid of them. I bet you do yeah. build up little personal relationships with the potholes after a while, don't you? Sort of, you know well, that. I bet that one there, that one flipping out. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a tenacious little. Not, do you give them names? I don't give them names, but I do hate some of them. Yeah, I hate going back to them all the time because because people complain about them constantly and it's not they complain to me when it's not really my fault no i know so, they're shooting the messenger yeah. in a way aren't they or not even oh, the yeah. messenger the the, yeah. the, the doctor yeah. they blame the physician um why has it got so bad in i mean can you tell in hove that it has gone bonkers in the last few years but it's the whole country actually yes um, i know but you're in hove yeah. you don't cover the whole country thomas do you yeah but it's the same everywhere it's the amount of cars on the road is it? Problem. Yeah, yeah. If you, you think of, you was thinking of the uh, roads in the 1980s. Oh, in Spain. Spain, yes. Yeah, 1980, 1970s, six, eight cars in the road. No, every oh, road's got a park. Yeah. yeah, but I don't yeah. think, try, there's not that much more now than there was 10 years ago, is there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there's that? loads, it, and it's getting worse, yeah. It's just constant. Uh, the, 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 the situation on the roads has gone past sat saturation. Well, that's why we should be getting on our bicycles. We should be getting on our bicycles. But that's, yes, that's the bloody, you think potholes are a problem when you're in a car. If you're in a bicycle, it can kill you, someone well, said. I don't, that, I don't use a bicycle myself, but that is the mindset. What we have to we have to change people's mindsets about using the roads. Same, Everyone I agree. Just, 
everyone just jumps in their car yeah, not and me. they just think it and, and, and it becomes selfish you see it does. it's about them and their journey Always. And they don't really care about anybody else tell me about the pothole you're working on at the moment it's on, a, it's on a high-speed road, so to get this fixed, they're going to have to get a crash cushion, which is £700 just to fix one pothole, and that's just for the crash cushion. That's before they pay the fellas. And the well, so so the they lorry. have to rent the crash cushion. The council doesn't own any crash cushions. No, no, they usually rent, uh, rent from a company that does traffic management. What's so a crash cushion? It's a big cushion that you put in front of the the block, so if any cars run into it, they don't kill anybody. Good you grief! See. It's not you're not messing about, are you? And, and so, what are you doing? A sort of site report that goes back to base, yes. yeah. And then I, they decide. They, they, people see them and they yeah. they report them to the council through the website, and then that comes to me. Then I go and assess it. And then I send that assessment, and then it's planned, and then it's it's organised. So it's not just going fixing a pothole. You know what well, I mean? A lot of no, people obviously. think it's just. It, it, it's quite. It, it's not complicated because we do it all the time. But because of the amount of cars on the road, and what happens is the cars double park along each road, oh. so the so the traffic travels in one channel up and down. Oh, so it's cool. twice as so heavy. it gets getting all the uh, double the wear and tear. Um, yeah, people blame the council. It's not the council. We make the potholes. There's nobody in the council who goes out and makes potholes. We make the potholes. Quite yeah, well, quite the opposite. There's someone in the council who goes out and fixes the potholes, and that's you. Yeah, are, are, yeah. are you literally there now? Are you are you literally yeah. on site with it? So what do you do? Do you listen to me in your earphones, or did you have me on in the car? What was what's the? I had, I had you on in the car driving to get to, to from, a pothole. I went from one one pothole on the other side of the city, yeah. and I had to drive to this pothole. And, and what did you think when the, when when we started talking about potholes on the radio? It must have been quite a magical moment for you. Not really. I, I just care about potholes all day. You know what I mean? It, they do me head in. They're, they're, they're just part of life. And, and is that it? Yeah. Is that, you're not in, responsible for anything else? It's not like potholes and... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I monitor all potholes, curbs, lining, uh, signs, um, all that. Anything to, that is related to like the bad. highways. Do you know what? You're one of the great unsung heroes, aren't you? Of society, because well, without you, things would be. You keep the country moving, <laughs> literally, Thomas. You're like and, and, the laxative what, of, of of Hove's roads, is what you are. <laughs> another thing, what people don't realise is, I mean, you're obviously able-bodied because you ride a bike, and yes, I'm able-bodied. Well, yes. well, if there's a loose slab, it's oh. nothing for me and you to step round. But, but if somebody you're in a older, or on crutches, or, or so, if you're yeah, old, and yeah. that's like, and then that's a nightmare that that could force someone to stay in the house. So you know, it is kind of social. You're a lovely it, man. It's, you're it's a lovely man, and, and, and oh, I, I, no, I mean it. And the people, people will be a bit more conscious now of the work that you do and the importance of, of it all. And hopefully, the next time someone's lining up to have a swing at a pothole person like you, they'll remember that it's their fault. There's a pothole there, not yours. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Mind how you go. Yeah. Mind how yeah, you go, you Thomas. All right. Right. Nice to speak to you. Likewise. Bye Take care. God bless. Look out, James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.51, uh, um, nine minutes to, to, to one in old money. Sheila will be with you shortly. Don't get your hopes up. I doubt that she'll be scaling the dizzy heights of pothole-related content on on, on her programme, but that, that's partly because we'll have covered all the bases by the time we hand over the baton. Um, extraordinary, really, to reflect upon the fact that one humble radio programme can have the former head of roads on Somerset Council listening and, and the head of potholes down in Hove as well. I know you might not be head of potholes, Thomas, but yeah, for me, you always will be head of potholes in Hove. Or road craters, as I'm now going to start calling them, because potholes lets them off the hook a bit. And it's not, I mean, it's simultaneously funny and not funny. Absolutely awful. I, I don't know that the more cars argument is the case. It's more likely to be less money being spent on fixing them or a little bit of both. Gavin is in Watford with some pothole-related content. What's it going to be, Gavin? Um, we'll start off with how we solve the problem, which is very simple. Local councils need more dragons, OK? Yes. Now, a dragon is basically a big truck with a computer-controlled saw on the front, which yes. cuts out a square the size of around the pothole. Oh, yeah. You then bring down the, uh, the blowtorch onto it to dry it out. Yes. You then, off the back of the wagon, you put in a pre-cut piece of asphalt. You then use the blowtorch to heat and seal it in. And away you go. An awful lot quicker than doing it manually. It's a patcher. A patcher, isn't it? Yeah. A so dragon I mean, patcher. We call him with a dragon. 
I like it. Same, yeah. I like it. Um, I mean, you've got. I mean, we, we need to just clarify. They, they, yeah. It won't be the answer in all cases. I don't no, think Glenda's not, Glenda's not, pothole not in Medway way. is going to need more than a dragon, isn't it? Because it's about yeah. forty feet deep. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's local con- council roads, not highways and byways. Let's but be but fair what you need, you know, I wonder how many people just shouted "gully suckers" at the radio, <laughs> Gavin. Because what you you could have had a multi-purpose vehicle: snowplow, gully sucker, patcher dragon and then it would be owned by the council and the same people would operate it whether they were clearing the 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 gullies whether they were plowing the snow or whether they were fixing the potholes but unfortunately it, that, modular kit like that is incredibly expensive yeah well exactly so yeah, it'll be some good. private sector yeah. company that rents them out yeah. for 10 times more than you'd be paying in normal circumstances agreed but, right that's that's that's, that's pothole that's right. related content item one Okay, now, um, in terms of your little story, I have a flying boat crash to tell you that it's pothole-related. I, I could tell from your voice, then, that you were quite proud <laughs> of this one. Go on, then, oh, fill your boots. So, <laughs> several years ago, when I was a kid, I was getting on the, onto the motorway with my dad driving, so seat belts on, we're going down the M1, yeah. and coming towards us is another car on the other side of the road, fair enough, yeah. which had a, a, a dinghy on the back of it on the trailer. So it's a little way away, it's coming towards us. And what the police tell me afterward, hmm. I told my dad afterward, was it, the trailer hit a pothole, the straps came loose, and the dinghy came over the crash barrier and straight into the front of our car, into the bumper in the engine. Sheesh. What do you remember? Uh, I remember basically not a lot, apart from sitting in the, in the uh, police car afterward, the police van afterward, or the police woman was holding my hand saying, it's okay, everybody's okay. Really? And that's so, pretty I mean, much Because it. it was pretty traumatic then. Yeah, it, it was, you know... And I mean, was the, how, how badly damaged was the car? Can you remember? Oh, the car was written off. Bro, you know, whoa, was, uh, really? So, I mean, when you say dinghy, you don't mean, like, something you blow up at the seaside? No, 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 a little bit bigger than that. A dirigible. You know, that it's, it was that, a yeah. dirigible, wasn't it? A uh, rigid inflatable. A, a rig, I think yeah. that's another word for a dirigible. Yeah. A rigid inflatable. Um, you don't want to be... Oh, you live and learn, don't you? Did it affect you? I mean, did you, did you have any counselling afterwards? No, I was seven at the time. No one had invented counselling back then. Come on. Well, no, 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 that's why you carry so much rage inside you, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you hit a pothole. You have flashbacks. Uh, thank you. I told you this would be all right. Once a year, maybe, I think, if that. Maybe a decade. Once a decade. Uh, Douglas is in Edinburgh. Douglas, your um, pothole-related content, please. Hello, James. Hello, Long Douglas. time listener, first time caller. Welcome. I, I'm in Edinburgh, and it's been raining for months here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and you know, and and it, and, it, and we have potholes here that are that are, are are so deep. And I saw the guys painting. They've been closing the roads and and putting in yellow lines and bus stop signs and things. And yeah. I said to one of the guys, I said, "Why?" <laughs> Why are you not fixing the potholes? They said the budgets for the painting of the lines. Yeah. And um, so I mean, I've got some sympathy for them. It's ca- you can't be carrying around a bucket full of tarmac when you're painting the lines to fill in the holes. But they could have well, done. Me- so what are they doing? Are they putting the lines around the holes or through the middle of it? Well, the ho- well, they seem to be putting them down the sides of them and, and round them. Well, not round them. That would be mental. Yes, but the um, <laughs> but but I'm on my third pair of trousers today. No, you know, you're not. Stop it. No, and, you're not. No, no, you're not. I am. You don't. You. I do should not just let me the... clarify before we get back to your wet trousers. A dirigible is actually an airship. I don't know where I got that from, so I can only apologise. He was quite right. It was a, it was a rigid inflatable? There was no dirigible. Well, what they tried to do, or what happened accidentally, was that the rigid inflatable almost became a dirigible. But that is a, not by the bite. Not you're not on your third pair. You're you're exaggerating. Because you're on the radio. No, no. Trust me, I'm not. There are really? so many potholes with the buses and with the trucks at the side of the road, and you can't see them because they're so filled with water. It yes. just looks like a normal piece of road. That's what you've and got to be careful. You go into it and then well, you're I know. The, the, the moral of the story is don't don't step in puddles. I'm not stepping in the puddles. I'm walking in the pavement. Yes, but, but you're stepping in the puddle on the pavement, and it turns out not to be a puddle, but to be a road cr- a pavement crater. No, it, no, you seem to have missed the Ooh. point, Ooh. right? All right. Which is, it's fighting on the road. Yeah. It's oh, so they're the splashing you on the pavement. Yes. Oh, I was missing the point. I apologise. So there's nothing <laughs> you can do about it. No, it's not. There's nothing There's nothing you can do. And they don't see it because it looks like it's the normal road because the, the potholes are so filled with water. Yeah. So they don't. They, and then they could come a cropper as well. Yeah, well. Uh, um, but, are uh, you from the same part of Glasgow as Billy Connolly? 
I'm from the same part. I'm from a place called Motherwell. I live in Edinburgh now. Yes. And I used to live in Chiswick and and, and see you buying pizzas and taking out your Volvo. That's, and I'm that's good me. friends with Milan. I'm on the bicycle well. now in the post office. But how are you from the same part of... Well, you're not, because your accent's very similar to Billy Connolly's. A lot of people are commenting on it. All right, OK. Well, no, no. Well, I live... I'm in Motherwell. Glasgow's 11 miles away. Yeah, no, it's similar. Uh... But you never said hello when our paths crossed. Well, you weren't as famous as you were now, but I would, uh. and I didn't know what you looked like. And you were in. The, it used to be Angel's pe- uh, Paper Shop, but it became a pizza place. Oh, that is a what we and are going away. There. But well, how did you know it was me then? I heard your voice because oh. I've been listening to you for a very long time. Oh well, thank you. Uh, and you're yeah. right. I, it was an odd. It was the same business, and I don't know. I mentioned this at the time. You've got a news agent, and you think I've had enough of running a news agent. They t- it was the same people who turned it into a pizza restaurant. I think wasn't it? Aye, aye. And it's still, and he's, and he's still running it. I was down there good, recently, and well, he's, and he's still running it. And you can go in and sit and have a pizza now. As it's to very away. good pizza. Very good pizza. Um, yeah. Next up, yeah. well, hopefully, I'll see you in there soon, Douglas. We're a bit right, f- we're a bit further west now, but I do head back that way on occasion on my li- on my line. But I mean, obviously you're in Edinburgh now, but you still come back. I'm in Edinburgh soon. Come along to the show. I, I shall. Uh, Who I are do- you? I don't remember, but it's something well, to I'll do. Che- what? I'll check it. Out. I'll check it out and come along. Yeah, I'm also in Glasgow. I'm at the I Write Festival. Well, they've called off the I Write Festival, but I'm still doing my event. Good Lord. Thank you, Douglas. I think we will let um, uh, 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 we'll let Michael have the last word on this. He writes, OK, James, you win. Broadcasting genius pulled off a pot for whole hour with a plum and even an emotional punch. That's from Michael in Kilburn, who I think speaks for us all. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player or the official app, which is indeed the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thank you, James. James O'Brien on LBC.